All righty, folks, I call this Board of Supervisors meeting to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All righty, folks. I once again apologize for being behind. Uh, do we have an adoption of the agenda? Second. Motions made by Mr. Weaver, seconded by Ms. Booker. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes 4 0 1. <laughs> Mr. Dahl, County Administrator's Report. And, and Mr. Chair, I just told me I told you I'll Oh, you got tired of depending on us to cut it back on. So you just made them live all the time. You ain't fooling nobody. All right, we're all over this. I've got a few things to report here. Do it one time, and Miss Harris is not going to let me hear the end of it. One time. So, uh, what was this? April 24th, that was this two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. Now. We had the, uh, the Earth Day, um, Earth Day event at Pleasant Grove Park, which was held April 24th. Um, again, we had the entire collection from 10, uh, 10 to 12, and then we had the hazardous, uh, hazardous waste from 10 to 2. Um, it was estimated we had about Thank you. Estimated we had about 300 to 350 vehicles that dropped off hazardous waste. Um, again, the Parks and Rec had budgeted 22 for hazardous waste and uh, 2,200 for tire collection. We were fine on the tire collection, but by about 1045, we saw that we were creeping up to, and it started at 10, creeping up to our limit. And the, the board was uh, nice enough to kind of give some head nods to move forward and we'll come back forward with, with uh, a formal uh, extension on that budget amount. Um, but again, the, the estimated amount they're still going through and, and collecting everything right now on the total numbers, but it's looking like it's going to be around 32,000 instead of the 22,000. Um, so, you know, not doing it for about three years now, you know, we had lots of people out there and like, so I want to thank the board for just kind of, um, you know, allowing it to extend a little bit longer because if we were to close it off 45 minutes into the event, that's, we had a lot of, a lot of upset residents that had a lot of stuff to drop off. So it, it was a good event. And again, thanks to uh, Jacob Lawrence, Wayne Bates, Seth Aldridge, and Bruce Anderson for helping with the event. And also for the Parks and Rec Department as well. They did a fantastic job. Kept, uh, kept I, I was there, but I, I didn't work nearly as hard as they did. Um, but, you know, um, Melinda Payne, Eric Amantrot, Dylan, uh, Faith. Faith, Aaron Spitzel, they all did a fantastic job. Um, so if, if you drove by 53 today, you'll see that we've got the Pleasant Grove Carnival happening for the next two weekends. So again, May 5th through the 8th, and then the following weekend, May 12th through the 15th. And so the times for the carnival on Wednesdays and Thursdays are 6 to 10 p.m. And then on Fridays, 5 to 10 p.m. And then on Saturday, uh, 10 to 3 and 5 to 10 uh, free entry and free parking. Um, armbands are $15 or $1 per ticket. Um, and anyone ages five and over must wear face masks at all times. Um, you know, and, and we, they, uh, Parks and Rec, they kind of spread it out a little bit more to allow for a little bit more social distancing out in the park area, just so people are not so crammed up. But again, uh, this weekend and next weekend, come on out to the Pleasant Grove Park Carnival. And a thousand people. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thousand people went. There we go. And again, uh, one, one thing: Happy Cinco de Mayo. So if we get out of here early, you can go have some Mexican food somewhere. Um, but if not, uh, again, just a reminder: it's Small Business Week. Um, so you know, we want to take some time this week, May second to the eighth, to celebrate our small businesses, whether it's a retail, food establishment, or, or whatever it is. Um, like I said. Uh, Mr. Rothamel has been going around and doing some videos and, and blogs with the small businesses, kind of just bringing some attention to them. 
you know, we got yard signs and we're just trying to bring some attention to our local businesses. And just some uh, upcoming board meetings, May 19th, we have a 7 p.m. regular meeting, uh, June 2nd, a 4 p.m. regular meeting, and then June 16th, a 7 p.m. regular meeting. And I'd be happy to answer qu any questions from the board. Um, the month of May is also set aside for the elderly. Marathon. Okay. That's a new one. Right down. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Bell, you had a comment about the Earth Day, and you said 3,200. 3,200 was that pounds or? No, no, I'm sorry. The, the 32,000. So, again, it was budgeted 22,000 for all the hazardous waste collection, okay. and and it, it's going to be closer to 32,000. And that's that was not cutting it off at 10:45 a.m. That's to, to let it go. So all those that were there. You know, we had that by 1030, we had the whole front field and all the rows already set up to go. And they still had cars coming through at noon uh, when I left. And like I said, it was starting to kind of slowly catch up at that point. Mr. Mr. Chair, also Thursday evening, uh, Dominion was out at Park Union School to present their program. I didn't see any of my colleagues out there, but I represented Park Union. Where were you all? I was okay. in St. Louis. You were in St. Louis. What uh, about I was there. I showed up uh, late. Well, right? seven thirty. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was man. working. You were working, <laughs> and Mr. Weaver. I'm thank you, Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, Mr. but um, I can vouch for Mr. O'Brien. We had we had some good paperwork. Um, yeah. I don't know if you all need a copy of that. Um, they posted it all on, on yeah. that site. Well and, too, so that's, yeah, that was good. so that was a, it was a good meeting. I was really delighted that I had Park Union people show up and a diverse group of people. Yeah, it was it was a, we had we had a good, age wise. Yeah, we had a good group of people. Mm -hmm. They asked really good questions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just you know, just good questions all around. And um, you know, I think Dominion was there to make sure that they could answer those questions. And that Dominion had a pretty. Uh, a pretty robust team there with them too to answer any type of question that would come about. So I think I think total numbers. I think Dominion had probably around eight representatives yes. there. Um, I think from the public and some of the board members, there was probably around. I think I tallied fifteen to sixteen people sh uh, showed up, including the board members, and then we had about four staff members there, um, just to kind of help out and give some ex extra explanation. But you know, it was it was, it was a good turnout. All right, is that it? That's it. That's it. All right, thank you so much, sir. All righty, uh, we're done with the county administrator's reports. I'll now open up the first round of public comment. Anyone wish to address the board should step to the podium. State your name and address. Please remember to keep your comments on to five minutes on topic and direct it to the board. And is there anyone wish to speak at this time? And Miss Johnson, I see you've made your way to the podium. I have. My name is Patricia Johnson. I live at 317 Shannon Hill Road in the Columbia District. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening to present uh, to one of your members um, something special from the Pluviana Historical Society. Our most recent publication is Hot Off the Presses. And the title of that publication is Pluviana's Rosenwald Schools. And Ms. Moselle Booker is getting the first official copy of this book for a very special reason. Yeah, this is a good book. You did a great job. For those of you who are unaware, um, Mrs. Booker essentially rescued the history of Fluvianna's Rosenwald School single handedly. She had a large role in preserving Dunbar Rosenwald School by maintaining it, securing it, and then passing it on to her niece, Carmen Smith, who's done a brilliant job restoring it turning it into a community center and a local history to a uh, local museum rather to black history. She also saved the Sprague's collection, which was a collection of photographs taken uh, from the very beginning of the Rosenwald projects in the 1920s up through the 1950s. When Reverend Sprague's passed away, she was able to secure that collection from a family member. It had sustained water damage. She brought it to us. We were able to have it restored with the help of Dave Sagarin. And many of those illustrations are in this publication. She also advocated for preserving the history of the Rosenwald schools. 
and spoke and lectured for decades at every public service organization that would give her a podium. Um, and she kept the history of the Rosenwald schools alive. We now have three large archival boxes of material in the Fluvanna Historical Society archives. Much of that material was collected by her and given to us by her over the years. So you have made this publication possible, right. but beyond that, you rescued a large and significant part of the history of education of this county. And for that, the Fluviana Historical Society and the community at large is always in your debt. So I wanted to commend you for your efforts over decades to rescue this history and to make sure that it was brought to light. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. That's a surprise. Yeah. Wow. Next, is there anyone else uh, in yes. person? Yes, I see. Yep. Okay, we got somebody online. Uh, Miss Kelsey uh, Calger. Yep. Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to give, I am normally a person who likes to just watch these meetings. Um, I felt really called to give public comment today um, because I was just so upset by the discussion around the George Floyd resolution at last week's meeting it felt really important to, to speak. Um, I just found it absolutely outrageous to see Supervisor Weaver tell Supervisor Booker that dealing with systemic racism in the county was her problem and it was something that he didn't have to worry about. Um, Supervisor Booker is the one black elected official in the entire county. And to say that it's her responsibility to address not just racial discrimination in the county, but his own attitudes just suggests that something's really broken on the board. So I want today to, to really just demand that the Board of Supervisors engage in some diversity inclusion training done by a real professional. Um, I would also say just, you know, for purposes of your constituents, it's really important that you stop speaking each over each other in meetings and that you keep your mics on and that you identify yourself when you're speaking because your constituents really need to know what your what their representatives are saying in these meetings and you know kind of hiding behind the fact that you know the camera goes all over the place is is, is really just not enough at this point in the pandemic um if you can't do this you know i i am certain that you can expect an electoral challenge because these are attitudes that the county is trying hard to move past and we need representation who's done that as well that's all i had to say is there anyone else willing, wishing to speak at this time? Ms. Harris, do you see anyone? I don't see anyone. Remember, it's star six if you're on a phone. Make sure to give everybody the opportunity to speak. Hearing no, no others, I will now close this first round of public comment. Mr. Mr. Chair, actually, oh. I, I apologize. Like I said, I was trying to catch you beforehand. So we got two. Uh, Two submitted um, comments um, to be read, asked okay. if it to be read. Um, one, the board received um, from a Millie Fife. She had sent this in and she had just emailed us today asking um, if her comments could be read, if she was not able to attend. I apologize for that. I did. I was not aware of this. One. That, that's all right. So there's, well, she just said it today. So like I said, she got a, a two page, a, a two page uh, comment. She would ask to be read. And then we also have a comment from uh, Perry Johnson. So um, just wanted to see if the board. You want to read them or you want me to read them? I can read them if the board wants me to. Well, let me get a swig of water really quick here before I go. <laughs> well, I, I will say this on the one that's two pages. I still say we should set the timer. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I know you read fast. I'll read fast. We can give it to our fast reading expert. <laughs> I will. Uh, so this comment is from uh, Millie Fife, 889 Jefferson Drive, Palmyra, Virginia. Dear members of the Board of Supervisors and Mr. Dahl, I'm writing to you because I'm troubled by the discussion during the April 21st Louisiana County Board of Supervisors meeting. Specifically, I'm concerned about the response to a proposed change to the resolution the board adopted in June 2020 after the killing of George Floyd and Rashard Brooks. When the BOS adopted the resolution last year, I was pleased it reflected an understanding of what was happening in the country and our collective and individual need to take corrective actions. The fact that one word was chosen over what I felt to be the more accurate term was disappointing, but I accepted the reasoning. However, now a verdict by a jury has been reached and the officer was found guilty of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. 
Whether or not supervisors, the county attorney, or the staff agree with the verdict is irrelevant. Furthermore, the county attorney, as he stated himself, does not know Minnesota law and does not have a license to practice in that state, and therefore was, in my opinion, out of bounds in offering an opinion on the matter. However, as the board has decided to wait for the judge to sentence Chauvin, I expect that the language in the resolution will be changed to reflect this. Waiting for the possibility of appeals to work through the system is a needless de delay. The judge and jury will have reached their decisions and the officer will have begun serving his sentence. While the BOS took an important step in the passing of this resolution 5-0, it also is important to the community that our, uh, that our uh, representatives recognize the verdict. I heard it suggested that elected officials should not weigh in on cases because of the possibility that it may sway the prospective juror in a possible appeal. Do you honestly feel that a resolution with language reflecting a legal finding by a board of supervisors in a small county in Virginia would be known by much less affect a jury in a state thousands of miles away at some possible future date? When the BOS adopted the resolution last year, I was pleased there was clear action I have included. I would be interested in knowing the status of those, specifically what has the BOS learned and what has the sheriff's office shared with the public about the reserve deputies? Who are the reserve deputies? Do they receive de-escalation de training? Um, and then she uh, references the resolution, whereas the Fluvanna County Board of Supervisors calls on the Fluvanna County Sheriff to increase transparency and make the public aware of the role, duties, membership, and training of the reserve deputy program and commit to training reserve deputies on crisis intervention, cultural diversity, and how to avoid uh, bias-based policing and the proper use of force. The discussion was contentious and hard to track. The setup of the camera for your meetings is such that you cannot tell who the speaker is and in individuals do not self-identify. The YouTube video spotlight spotlights the agenda with the people in the room relegated to a small corner of the screen. If you can't recognize the voice, you don't know who said it. In addition, participants do not always keep their microphones on. For transparency and accountability reasons, it's helpful to be able to follow in real time who is talking. While minutes are released, these do not provide the information that a transcript would as far as what actually transpired at the meeting. Having an audio and a video recording is almost not sufficient as again, you can't always tell, you can't always tell who says what. Especially during a time when meetings are closed to the public, but even after residents are allowed to attend, there is no reason for this to continue to be an issue one year into the pandemic. Supervisors are responsible to to their constituents for what they say and do at public meetings and on behalf of the community. If we cannot determine who is speaking at a public meeting, then, then how is this a good faith demonstration of accountability? Please improve the video and audio so that each person can clearly be seen and heard and if possible, provide transcripts. There are 15 elected officials in Fluvanna County. Only one of these is a person of color. The way the discussion devolved at this meeting shows that the supervisors have work to do to honor the resolution. Um, if you turn into the meeting at the two, two hour 31 point, you'll hear what I'm referring to and it, and it references the meeting link. The behavior uh, exhibited not only showed grave disrespect for Ms. Booker, but for all the black and brown residents of Fluvanna. I look forward to hearing what next steps the board will take to honor what it committed to last summer and when, as the resolution states, be it further resolved that this board commits itself to efforts to engage the community in constructive, honest, and substantive dialogue to better understand where inequities exist and to adopt policies to el eliminate them. This board is committed to ensuring a safe and healthy environment where everyone can thrive, and we urge all county residents to join us in this crucial ongoing effort. We recommit to our intent to build and support a united community of all Fluvanna residents based upon mutual respect, equity, and well being. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Millie Five. Dude, you could, you wow. must have practiced that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And, and the next one was Miss yeah, Johnson. Let me get a quick. Uh, and this one's short. Um, again, this uh, comment is from uh, Perry Johnson. Uh, to the Fluvanna Board of Supervisors, I am proud to be served by a governing body that works together to unanim unanimously pass a budget that, among other accomplishments, fully funds the request of our public schools. I'm grateful to each of you for your consideration and service. Again, Perry Johnson, 229 Pine Lane, Fork Union. Ms. Harris's comments not asked to be read. Right. 
I'm sorry. Or Mrs. Harris's comments not asked to be read. She did not ask for her comments to be read in public comment. All righty. Thank you very much, Mr. Dahl. Yep. All righty. Now we'll move forward with action matters. Well, let me <laughs> double check. We got nobody else and we have, no okay, nothing else to read. All righty. I'll now close the first round of public comment. Next is action matters A, Regional Cigarette Tax Board, resolution of interest, Mr. Dahl. Yeah, Mr. Chair, so if you remember, this is just kind of a follow-up on wh where we were before. Um, we briefly talked about this. So again, a new local taxing authority. Um, legislation was passed in the 2020 General Assembly session authorizing counties to, lever to levy cigarette taxes at a maximum rate of 40 cents per pack beginning July 1, 2021. Uh, much work has to be done on the issue still, but there are discussions of the cigarette tax being administered on a regional basis. Um, preliminary conservative estimates show this could generate around 150 to 200,000 annually in the county. Um, kind of in, in discussions of this, the Tom, Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission has been um, kind of acting as, as a liaison with this to try and uh, gauge the regional approach. And they have uh, reached out to both localities with inside and outside the TJPC boundaries, um, kind of just understanding who's interested. Uh, there's been little work groups. I've been, been on some of the work groups as well, kind of looking at the issue. Um, so again, this regional board would likely be modeled under, there's a, Northern Virginia has a cigarette tax board that, that's been in place for a while. And that board actually serves 19 localities up in that region. So kind of the structure of it would be kind of the same. Uh, and again, in the board package was kind of, I, I think there's another localities um, or another regional uh, cigarette tax boards kind of uh, make up too. But again, knowing the numbers, um, for TJPDC, knowing the numbers to move forward, that's helpful for them in kind of determining how we move forward with this, what it looks like, you know, how many localities are interested, you know, is it a one, is it a one employee thing? Is it a two employee thing? So again, the, the TJPDC is just looking for interest and this resolution expresses that interest. And that's all it is. It's just a resolution to express interest um, and, and they were looking for input from localities by the end of May. So again, this doesn't commit the board to say, yes, we wanna do a regional cigarette tax, but it kind of sets the groundwork a little more formally for us moving forward in that direction. Um, and I think that is it. And I would be happy to answer any questions the board has. All right, are there any questions from the board? Mm -hmm. All righty, hearing none. Uh, no other questions, no other discussions. All right, do we have a motion? I move the Board of Supervisors adopt the resolution in participating in regional cigarette tax administration as presented. Do we have a second? Second. We got a motion made by Ms. Booker, seconded by Ms. Zeger. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5-0. All righty, B, next up is B, Proclaiming May, Community Action Month, Michael Onsario, AmeriCorp volunteer from MACA. Is Michael present or is he online? You see him on there? I, I believe that I'm Catherine Fay. I, I'm here for Sarah Hanks, who's had a family emergency. Um, so I'm not sure if Michael's here, but I am here. If, if, I, I if certainly not. hope everything turns out okay. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. We have the Proclaiming May 2021 Community Action Month, whereas community action connects individuals and families to approaches that help them succeed and promotes community-wide solutions and challenges throughout our cities, suburbs, and rural areas, and whereas community action builds and promotes strong economic stability as an essential aspect of enabling and enhancing stronger communities which in turn promotes self-sufficiency and ensuring that all Americans can live in dignity. And whereas community action connects millions of children and families to greater opportunity, transforming their lives and making our communities and our nation stronger. And 
whereas community action serves 99% of Americans count, America's counties and rural, suburban, and urban communities, offering life-changing services that create pathways to prosperity by connecting families to job training, affordable housing, utility assistance for seniors, promoting community-wide solutions and sharing expertise. And whereas community action will continue to implement innovative programs that create a greater chance of success for everyone, will continue to focus on a broader range of community challenges to ignite economic growth and ensure all families can benefit and will continue to be a voice for the disenfranchised. Now, therefore, the Fluvanna County Board of Supervisors does hereby complain, uh, proclaim, uh, is this my, should I continue or is this? Okay does proclaim May 2021 as Community Action Month in recognition of the hard work and dedication of the Monticello Area Community Action Agency, which is passed and adopted this fifth day of May, 2021. And Sarah wanted to take just a moment to uh, offer her uh, gratitude and thank you for the recognition of Community Action Awareness Month and your continued support and partnership as we strive to ensure that all families have access to the resources needed for a thriving future. Like you, we believe in the promise of community action, that our work changes people's lives. It embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes Fluvanna a better place to live. MACA's two-family, full family generation approach to programs and services breaks cycles of generational poverty. Our Head Start program which will soon be expanding to include early Head Start services for expectant mothers and children, um, birth to age three, is a good example of our commitment to partner with parents to support their educational and career goals, provide high quality early education for students, connect our families to resources to promote their success as they enter Fluvanna County Public Schools and later our workforce, um, project, project discovery and rural outreach also provide critical services for students and families, all supporting our goal of eradicating poverty in the Fluvanna community. So thank you for recognizing this important work of our families and staff as we celebrate Community Action Awareness Month. Thank you so very much. Are there any questions or discussion from the board? I have one question, Ms. Catherine. This is Moselle Booker. Um, your birth to three programs that you are preparing to open, is that only for Charlottesville, Albemarle? Does it come into Fluvanna, Louisa, and Nelson? No, I know Nelson wouldn't. Can we use that, okay. sir? I believe that it is just in Charlottesville, but I will have Sarah check back with you because I know that we are rushing to get our facilities um, in mm -hmm. place and get all our licensure requirements updated for that particular address. So I think that it is just Charlottesville at this time, but we absolutely hope to expand to the counties as soon as uh, we are able. Thank you. All righty, anyone else? Okay, hearing none, do we have a motion? I move the Board of Supervisors approve the proclamation proclaiming May 2021 Community Action Month as presented. Second. Got a motion made by Mrs. Booker and seconded by Mrs. Eager. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair says aye. Motion passes 5-0. Okay. Thank you. Next up is C, purchase of Fluvanna TMP 51A138 and 51-A-139. Mr. Dahl. Yeah, uh, I guess this is Mr. Dahl, Mr. Rothmel. Uh, Tag team and, and 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 Fred too, and like I said, we'll have to explain it. Couple yeah, slides uh, I right. figured it was going to end up in Mr. Yeah. So county owns property in Fork Union, as you're aware. So we have uh, currently with the two original parcels, which is where the community center and the fire department are, and then in 2019 you purchased what was then known as the Shelton property, um, TMP 51A30, which. Um, that gave you the three original parcels that we have at this time. 
The Wells property are two adjacent parcels near the rear of the property. Uh, 51A, 138, and 139. One's 15 acres and the other is 10 acres. Uh, these parcels are part of our site characterization of the Fort Union property uh, for a future business, business park. Um, so we have we did include this. Yeah. And then, then I guess we can let Fred talk about the legal piece a little bit. We've been working on this for a while. What it, this was a this has been a very complicated proceeding all along. It's really been unfortunate because the yeah. Wells family has been extraordinarily cooperative. And um, and so, so frankly, I'm very much disposed to try to help them if we can getting through this. Uh, by the way, Mr. Wells's grandson was a, is a freshman at JMU, and he was a mm -hmm. he was a star in the in the uh, mm -hmm. Division One AA, what is now what they used to call One mm -hmm. AA Championship um, on Sunday. So, uh, Mr. Wells is very very happy mm -hmm. about that, and I, I don't blame him a bit. And he's also a very proud grandfather. So. Uh, yes. he'll be playing in the semifinals this weekend he will indeed and yeah. i'm sure he's he's to just to use the vernacular i think this kid's really good mm -hmm. um, but uh what what you have before you is obviously very highly technical and very uh, very detailed uh, mrs deloria did in my office did the did the work on this and she has done what I would consider to be a masterful job of, of overcoming some of the difficulties involved in it. Uh, the purpose of its, of its being here is for you all to approve the, 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 the granting of the deed and, and according to the terms of the closing statement. For those of you that, that may be a little curious about what, what a closing statement is, it is simply a memorialization of the execution of the of the contract which we entered into some time ago for the county to buy the property it explains where the money's going coming from and where the money's going and various other things uh, the deed obviously is a is something that you're all familiar with um, the um, one peculiarity of this deed is that uh, and this is not really unusual there's a very good reason for it the there are a lot of details about the the um, the title of the property and, and its history and, and that sort of thing, which are not laid out verbatim in the deed, but there is a reference to the order of where the court declared our title to be good. So there, that's going that is already of record. So if anybody had a question about where the, where things came from or how it got there or whatever, it's all set forth in, let me say, excruciating detail in that order. It's a multi-page order. Uh, Judge, Judge Moore was, uh, uh, I think suffice it to say, was impressed with Mrs. Deloria's diligence. Uh, but so anyway, that's, I'd be happy to, for you to read it in detail if you want to, if you just don't think you have anything else to do. But um, if you have questions about it, I'll be glad to try to answer. And, and we own that strip in front, don't we? Yes, that's the Shelton property. That's Shelton. And this, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but do you see that that more or less rectangular parcel with the creeks going at the back? At one point, that this is all one parcel, and it it um, various things were conveyed off, mm -hmm. um, and um, so the, the where the where the community center is. That was originally conveyed off by the county to the schools. The schools right. then conveyed it back. So that's why you see these various parcels there. But but they're all they are they all were originally one parcel, and our objective is to make them one parcel so we can redevelop. And we anticipate our site characterization coming back this summer. And, and just one thing too, so we, we actually have two motions here. And so if you remember, we sold the property, the properties were under contract for $45,000, but really what, what we really need for the board to move forward is a supplemental appropriation um, to purchase the properties for 30,000. And the reason for that is 
There was lots of work that Mr. Payne's office had to do as far as clearing title for the property. So what we are actually transferring to the, to the, uh, to the uh, seller is actually $30,000 because we're getting a, there's basically a $15,000 credit to, to, to clear, uh, clear the title issue. The contract had, had a provision that, that the sellers would pay our attorney's fees for clearing the title up to a maximum of 15,000. I will tell you that it cost a good deal more than that. It, um, I, you know, I sat and watched you all do that. I mean, the lady, what's her name again? This is Mosel Booker Ms. speaking. Mrs. Gloria. Yes. She, she went back almost to slavery time. Did you all leave all of that history with the Wells family? I mean, she, she it's all had, set. It's all set out in the order. Okay. Okay. Cause she, they really had a good history study of yep. their family. We had written a, uh, uh, a, title opinion based mm -hmm. on its research. And, and a lot of the research was really outside the regular record. Um, Mrs. Gloria found things that I wouldn't have found, frankly, yeah. but things like um, obituaries and, and um, family history. Of course, we, we conferred with, with Mr. Wells and his sister-in-law it, it really quite extensively. And, uh, and all of that was laid out in the title opinion the title opinion then was was virtually copied into the order so that it would be of record. So mm -hmm. our, our concern was that the county intends to sell this property in some, some form. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible for potential purchasers so that, that there wouldn't be any question when we, came, when we got around to selling. Mm -hmm. So there's two motions, one to uh, approve and accept the deeds of conveyance is, is, is the long and short of motion number one. And number two is, is actually uh, approving the funds and where the funds are coming from to pay for it. Any other comments or can, questions from the board? So we're to make both motions, correct? This well, we'd make one and vote on it and yeah. then we'll make the next one. Yes, ma'am. We got separated into two. Do I have a motion? I move the Board of Supervisors approved acceptance of deeds of conveyance of Fluvanna tax map parcels 51A138 for $27,000 and 51A139 for $18,000 from Henry D. Wells and others subject to approval of the form of all documents by the county attorney. I further move to authorize the county administrator to execute the deeds of ev to evidence such acceptance and to authorize such actions and execute any other documents he deems necessary or appropriate in connection with the purchase, all contain such terms as may be approved by the county administrator. Second. Okay, Mr. Before, Chairman, before you vote on, let me just, I forgot to say one thing. These documents have been submitted to the Wells, the, 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 the grantors, the Wells family. We have, we've gotten Mr. Wells's approval. Um, it, there are a number of others. I don't anticipate any problem with that, but we didn't want to hold up, hold up the transaction, getting the awards approval for another month. But just be aware that it's possible that somebody may come back and, and want something changed, but we'd bring that back to the board. And what would that mean? Well, it depends on what, I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna to object to anything, but-, but uh, You never know. Well, one of the things that's peculiar about this transaction is they, they don't have an attorney. So, uh, we had to, to divide up the money because they don't have, they have varying interests. The various people have varying interests in the property. And it's possible, I don't think it's likely, but it's possible that one or more of them may object to it. Mr. Wells, Mr. Wells has reviewed and approved them all. So um, he's the one with the largest interest. So I don't expect this to be a problem, but I want you to be aware of it. So the percentage is someone might feel that their percentage is not appropriate then, they could. There are, there are two issues in dividing up the property. One is the percentage ownership by each of the, of the different people. And the other one is to, uh, is to give consideration to Mr. Wells since he's paid the taxes for a number of years. I think that's entirely appropriate. That is certainly the way we would do it in a, in a, uh, in a more conventional transaction. Uh, I strongly support Mr. Wells's uh, view in that, and I'm I feel 
again, strongly that Mrs. Deloria has done a, a, an extraordinarily careful and thorough job on this. And there shouldn't be any objections. I just bring it up to make sure that you understand it's not quite final yet. They would all know the circumstances that he's paid those taxes in the past. We've certainly tried to make that clear right. in the documents. And, you know, beyond that, that's, that's about as much as we can do. If they have disputes between themselves, they need to resolve those. I don't think they will. Okay. Before we go any further, I need to ask something. I can't believe I'm actually going to ask this, but looking at the first line in that, I move the Board of Supervisors approved. Should that be just approved? Yes. Oh, yes. What? Please mark that. The, the yeah. PE teacher <laughs> <laughs> caught an English note. And that might be the first time in my life I've ever done that. But anyway, <laughs> seems odd we got a motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Ms. Booker. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5-0 and motion number two. I move the Board of Supervisors approve a supplementary appropriation of $30,000 from the unassigned fund balance for the purchase of Fork Union parcels 51A138 and 51A139. Second. Got a motion made by Mr. Weaver and seconded by Mrs. Eager. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Board. Thank you. And one thing I'll add is that's one of the things that this does is gives us 100, over 100 acres. Uh, 134 total, but we know some of that acreage will obviously we're not moving the fire department, we're not moving the community center. Well, the, we the, the burn building, the acreage. Needs to be established by by the the outer okay. boundary yeah. survey. Yeah, so so we'll have that survey yeah. as part of the study. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Appointments D Board Commission and Committee appointments, Ms. Solis. And again, I'll be Ms. Solis. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, three appointments. Um, so we have actually two um, representatives interested in the one uh, one Fluvanna County representative for the Jump Board. And then um, we have two, are, and Ms. Harris or Ms. Solis, are those our reappointments or are those just brand new for the other right. two, brand new? And then we've got just one person each for, for the uh, at-large position for a Parks and Rec Advisory Board, and then one for uh, Ag Forestal District Advisory Council land use position, just one, uh, one applicant for each of those. So like I said, unless the board has some, uh, some reason not to put those two in those two positions. I would be happy to pull up, you know, the the, the applications for the job board, or if the board has some uh, some thoughts or any questions. Um, do do we only have one um, position for the job board? Available? There's we have two positions, but there's only one opening right now. Um, okay. So we um, have to choose one of these two. Yeah. Yeah. There's um. I think Hal. I think Hal Morgan is is one of the was is already on the jump board representing Fluvanna County. Mr. Chair, may I make a comment? Yes, ma'am. You beat me to it. I was getting ready to I, ask if there any comments yeah, from yeah. the board. Uh, this is Melissa Booker speaking. Um, I know uh, Leslie Woodfall, and I know Pamela Bevins. Both of them are wonderful. I know Pamela very involved in a lot of things. Leslie called me not long ago and said, Ms. Booker, I would like to give back to the county. What is, what can I do? And I told her, I said, go to the site, pull out applications and mark those committees and boards and commissions that you would like to be involved in. I was really surprised and delighted that she followed through. She lives in the Cunningham region. I don't think Ms. Bevins will hold this against me. <laughs> I would like to, to get this young lady, Leslie Woodfalk, involved so that um, she can catch on and be able to do other services in the county. So that's just my recommendation that Leslie Woodfalk, she was a Haskins, a maiden name. I mean, that's her, you probably know her, right? 
his living wife died. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, I was wondering. Uh -huh. Can you pull up your resumes real quick? Yeah, I kind of. Uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to say on behalf of Miss Bevins? Oh, she's a super person. You know, yes, you know, she's she very works. wonderful and very hard. Everything, triad, she's Absolutely. really involved. So, Miss um, Woodfolk uh, uh, put her experience, um, what she did at high school and, and, and where she did some uh, um, college work at Piedmont and American National College. And then just uh, it lists her uh, site activities and memberships and, and just kind of re reiterating what Ms. Booker just said about wanting to give back to her community. Um, and so, so this is Ms. Woodfolk's application. All right, anybody else? Can we, is, we'll pull up Ms. Bevins. Yep. And uh, for Ms. Bevins, uh, BS in education, master's in school psychology, uh, teacher um, for 30 years. And then it talks about the difference boards, commissions, and committees, current or prior that, that she's been involved with. Um, and then talks about some civic activities, um, class 10 of the Savannah Leadership Program and currently in FLAG. So I think that um, being on the John board is, is a little more complicated than, than it may have been in the past. Um, we've been trying to find a way to serve the community better. I mean, I think they come out to the community twice a week, and that's just simply not enough. <coughs> and, um, I think I think we need to see if we can do better. And um, I'm concerned about John. That'll take money, more money from us. Thanks. I'm I'm sorry. Are you suggesting that neither of these candidates are is fit for that? Position, is that what um, you're saying? You know, I really, I don't know, but I'm saying that um, twice, like I think I told you before, a friend or a constituent came to me to ask me to help him and he um, wanted to use John because he's 84 and he's afraid he's gonna lose his license. <coughs> so I, I called John, got him signed up and they told me that they only come out twice a week and that they would pick him up between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning and he should try to make his doctor's appointment at 10. And then they would pick him up between 2.30 and 3.30 to bring him home. Well, you know, that's just not something an 84-year-old person with a walker can do. And so I, and then I told him, you know, he's going to have to, he said, I'll have to find some other way to get, but, you know, when you make a doctor's appointment, you don't always get to say, well, I'll come at 10, you know. So um, anyway, I just think that, we need to um, either negotiate with John or find a better way to help our people get to do the essential things they need to do. I do agree that the, that the representative for the John uh, board is important, especially given what's occurred at John, um, you know, just as, as our needs continue to grow. Um, I like the experience that Mrs. Bevins has over Mrs. Woodfolk would certainly encourage Mrs. Woodfolk to continue to do other things, but personally, looking at the two resumes and candidates, I would be in favor of Mrs. Bevins. A difference to Mrs. Woodfolk. I think most of book are speaking. I think sometimes we have to give people a chance. Um, she did check other areas and all of those areas would be a challenge for her because she is young and hasn't had the opportunity to do thing, other things or get other things on her resume. But I, but I see what you're saying, Tony. And then what, what Mrs. Um, Igger is saying, we need to have John to come back and talk to us sometimes when it's appropriate for them to do so. Because I think that we don't quite understand their program. And an 85-year-old man should be able, if he has Medicare, should be able to get a cab to take him and bring him back home. 
there are other services other than junk and that can meet the needs of the elder. I think that you have a, that there's a company here that delivers. Man has a station wagon. Oh, what that is, was the company that was the business name? of the week not long ago. Mr. Rothenau, yes. which business was that? What's the company's that? name that takes it? They, they, they just won the award. Reliable Rides? Oh, reliable Rides. Yeah, and I don't know how much money this gentleman has, but um, we do need to. I, I appreciate the fact Ms. Zeger is looking out for him, but we do need to let people know what other services there are in the county for people who need it at that age. If he doesn't have family, or, you yeah, know, no family. Yeah, someone, Medicare, sends cash. Yep. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's just my input. We just need to find out more. And I have no problem if you want to go Beverly. Um, I'll just keep encouraging Leslie to get to continue to want to be involved. <laughs> These positions don't come due very often. People get in there and they enjoy it and they stick to it. Roselle, I would think maybe she could make an application on, a, on another uh, job that she would like, that she would still qualify for it and get her involved in it. Um, pull up her, her um, Ms. Woodfolk? checks. Leslie checks, she checks several areas. Do you yeah, cancel? She, uh, she checked um, Java, she yeah. checked FAPT, and she checked the Social Services Board. See, FAPT is something she could never be on. She Youth Advisor well, Council and the Job Board. Well, yeah, YAC's really just kind of really folded. Yeah, the it's folded. So it's probably it's been be folded. Now. Um, now, my one thought sitting here, and this is uh, Mike Sheridan was sitting there listening to you, Ms. Seeger. If there was something, and please don't shoot me when I say this, Ms. Harris, but if there's a way we could have people contact us that we could possibly mm -hmm. try to connect them with folks in the community, somebody like this gentleman that's, you know, 84. I mean, the car, I hate to say it this way, the car I learned to drive on was a 1947 Plymouth that there was a gentleman in the community and mom and dad just kind of watched out for him and for them watching out for him he gave them his car when he uh moved to an assisted living facility in richmond and still remember that three speed on the collar but if there's somewhere we could contact that we could try to coordinate possibly churches which that might be in that community that might have the opportunity to help because, uh, you know, we all need a helping hand sometimes when we get down. Yes. I think that's one of the things that made Pluvanna special a long time ago that I think people still do, but don't do it as much because now we come, we become more crowded. And when we become more crowded, you don't know your neighbors as well as you did when they were a mile and a half away. Neighbors all over the United States come in. Yes, sir. You know, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. We don't, yeah. you know, with the more people that come in, we don't know our neighborhood as good as we sure. used to. Um, and back then, you used us. to have to depend on each other, too. It was with the less that you had, you depended on each other yes. a lot more for everything around you. Anyway, that, that was just a thought. I don't know if there's any way we could come up with something. You know, just a list, something of that nature. Um, and that might be something when we get back to where we are able to meet with the clergy and the communities that we could. You know, if folks contact us, hey, is it all right if we contact you? Yeah, and, and we, we generally get, you know, sometimes we'll get calls about, you know, and Ms. Harris does a pretty good job of field, fielding this, you know, someone may want some type of service like that. Right. And, you know, we try and put them in contact with, you know, some of the nonprofits and other outside agencies that, that you know, that we contribute yeah. in. And, that, that's a, that's all I'm saying. Just one of those things, because we all know that there's different groups that help in different ways, and most folks just don't know about it. I mean, since I've been on here, I've learned, and we keep throwing these, I forget what the word is, all these little initial things out there, and I'm trying, all right, which one's that? All right, um, do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move. The Board of Supervisors approved the following Board Commission and Committee appointments. John Ford, 
Savannah County Representative Pamela Bevins, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board at large position, John Bishop Larson, Agricultural Forestry District Advisory Council Land Use Position, Mark Imhoff, all with terms beginning May 5th, 2021, and uh, John ending June 30th, 2022, Parks and Rec entering June 30th, 2022, and Agricultural Forestry District ending July 31st, 2024. I'd like to just make a comment about Mark Einhoff. Um, I know him, and when I first met him, I found out what he did. And I said to him, so you really are a rocket scientist. And he, he is. I didn't really know that until I read his resume. But um, he bought part of our farm. That's how long. That was, that was interesting. When I opened it up, I was like, great day. It's actually it's kind of thick. And then I started looking. I went. Yeah, he really is a rocket scientist. I, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're really fortunate to have so many people that want to serve our community Absolutely. in so many different ways. And it, like the gentleman on the JR, JRWA board. Uh, Mr. Dunning. Yes. As Mr. Dunning just happened to move here when we're starting a water project. And that's been his expertise in the military for 30 years. All righty. Um, do I have a second? Second. Motions made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Ms. Zeger. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes I, aye. Whoop. I oppose the joint board, but I um, say aye to the Parks and Rec and Agriculture Forestry District. Yes, ma'am. And the chair votes aye. So those will be first one is four z four one zero, and the next two are five zero. All righty. Presentations E, Colonial Circle, Coves at Monticello Affordable Workforce Housing. Mr. Dahl. So yeah, so we've got um, we've got a, a few folks here today uh, from uh, uh, Pinnacle, uh, Mr. Park, and Mr. Carrington. Oh, Mr. Greer, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so, so we got a, we have him, uh, both of them here today to kind of discuss this. So if the board remembers, um, Sorry. No, you're fine. I just want to make sure that I'm listening. Except we, um, you know, they did a presentation to the board. I guess it's back in February now. I think I believe is when it was at this point to discuss uh, the codes at Monticello, which is a multifamily development uh, in Colonial Circle, um, and and the discussion was about. Um, you know, looking at looking at the work that they've done, the type of projects that that, that they do, um, and there was a request as well to do um, some some tax incentives uh, for the for the property taxes for the property. So, um, Mr. Park, do you want to come up and do the presentation? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Dahl, members of the board, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is William Park. Represent Pinnacle Construction Development Corporation in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and I wanted to follow up, and, and first of all, thank you for letting me attend tonight. It's a little bit easier to do this versus a, a Zoom meeting. Amen. It's a pleasure to see each one of you individually, and of course, you too, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Um, what, what I'd like to do, Eric, I, I wanted to go through the, the presentation we did the other week. I'll do it relatively quickly. I know we only have 10 minutes, and I've changed a few slides. And then at the end of that, I, I'd certainly like to get into more detailed discussion, any questions you all have. And of course, if any, any of you all did visit any of our properties, um, any conversation you like or to talk about that, I'm glad to speak to that too, if you would. So, um, Eric, if you don't mind, if you're controlling that. Yep. You okay. just, just let me know next slide. Yeah, just uh, just briefly, as I said, uh, we have four companies that we have when we do these projects. We're vertically integrated. Uh, I'll start with where it all begins is with the mortgage banking, where you have to have money and finance in order to do these projects. Uh, Bluestone Capital Advisors, um, also, Bluestone Land is our development company. From there, we move to the contracting, Pinnacle Construction. And then just to be clear, we manage all of our own properties too, which I think is very important that we do that with our asset management company, Park Properties. Eric, please. Um, I, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. You all know where Colonial Circle is. Uh, ne next, Eric. This is an update that we have done on the site plan. A little, basically the same as what you saw before. The same, the same property. It's just we've taken the buildings, and if you all went and visited a couple of our properties, these are the same buildings: clubhouse, 
Only difference being at uh, the, the properties that I gave you before, we did not have a pool at those properties. We felt like the location of this, the number of units, when we get up to over 100 units where we have 124 units, that enables us to have the size to put in an amenity like a pool, which I think is important here, given that we're in the middle of this residential subdivision that is gonna be built. So um, it, as you can see there, five buildings, a community center, pool, and then a separate maintenance building. And all this has been designed to meet the current ordinance, ordinances that you all have in the county. Next, please. And then a, a quick summary, as I said, 124 apartments, 92 two-bedroom units, 32 three-bedroom units, uh, and then the other ancillary buildings that go along with it. Uh, more additional detail, I guess. So one of the things we wanna talk about, and, and uh, as I move forward with my presentation, understand that affordable housing is what we're presenting here tonight, okay? And in doing so, we have to use uh, tax credits, a low-income housing tax credit program, and these tax credits are allocated through Virginia Housing Development Corporation. Um, in doing so, we have to keep the combined level of everyone that lives in these properties at or below 60% of the area median income. And what we're proposing here is to do kind of a, a income averaging, if you will, a combination of 50, 60, and 70%. So as you can imagine, for every 70% unit that we do, we have to do a like amount of 50 units to average out at 60. But what that does, that gives us an opportunity to serve more income levels here. And in my subsequent slides, you'll see some of these income levels that we can serve and what those incomes actually are. So in this case, we've got 42 at 50%, 44 at 60%, and then 38 units at 70% throughout is what we're proposing with Virginia House. Next, please, Eric. And, and so what, what does that equate to? So if, if the way this program is set up, it is regulated by the federal government and then the federal government pushes down these regulations to the state housing authority, Virginia Housing, and Virginia Housing is the group that oversees us. And what we have to do, we have to qualify every single person that moves into these units. This qualification is then in turn sent to VHDA. They sign off on it to ensure that we are in fact housing those people that we said we are housing. In the event that you do not house these people, then the IRS wants these tax credits back. And I can imagine, or as you all can imagine, that's a pretty big stick to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So in this case, and you all have the chart, I won't sit here and read it all to you, but what it does, it gives you an idea. Um, for example, if let's just go to a family of three at 60%, then the maximum income that that family could earn in order to live there would be 57,760. So I just use that as an example, and you can see that for every family size. And what, what happens, this is, a, this is a form that comes from the government, so you don't see 70% there, because of course they make it hard on me by not putting 70%, but the math would be taking the 60 and 80, adding them together and divide by two, and that's gonna give us what the 70% range would be. Next, Eric. So, so what we did when we looked at this, we go, okay, what does that mean as far as specifically people that work in the county. Again, this is a list of uh, current job titles in the county and you can see the wages. And then at any time, if you all would like to go back and look at the previous slide, you can kind of see where certain income ranges, uh, salary ranges fit in with the income ranges that are allowed for this particular county. But these are all ones that would qualify easily, many of them on a just one person basis and even some of those, if, if there were two of the same that, that had different salaries in the county, you combine them, they would still be eligible to live in, these, in the complex. Next, Eric. So one of the things, um, and, I, and I'm, I'll, I'll back up, Eric. I, you, you mentioned Sean. Sean and Bo are the ones that originally, Bo Carrington, that with Colonial Circle, have worked on the uh, multifamily portion of this. And then we have an expertise of we, we've dealt with this type of housing for over 30 years, and they asked us to be involved with the project to partner with them. So I, I just wanted to back up and tell you how we got involved in the project. And Eric, when you go to the next slide that you did ha had up there, when we were asked to be involved in the project, one of the first things we did 
was we asked uh, Eric and, and uh, we asked Sean and Bo, we said, well, what does a comprehensive plan say for the county? Um, so Eric, if you would go to the next slide, next slide. And, and so with respect to affordable housing, this was one of the first things we looked at and we went through your comprehensive plan to see, is there a need, first of all, affordable housing? Do you all feel that there's a need? And then are you all encouraging affordable housing to be constructed? And this is one of the first things we always look at when we're dealing with the locality is, what does the locality think about what we're trying to build? So in this case, you know, I can reference chapter two here where it encourages affordable housing. And then I think, you know, the executive summary does a good job on page six where, I mean, clearly it states to remain sustainable and livable, the community needs diverse and affordable housing. And specifically, for those people that are under 80% of the area median income. Next slide, Eric. And so these are a couple of other areas in your comprehensive plan where I feel like you're promoting uh, the need for affordable housing. You've recognized the need for affordable housing and especially that second paragraph there where community development, planning commission and staff are tasked with the ongoing work to offer incentives for building mixed income housing with an emphasis on workforce and affordable housing. And I, I, I paraphrase a little bit after that. So, and that'll lead into what we're talking about or asking for tonight in order to partner with you all to do this affordable housing. Eric, next slide. Um, so in summary, project development costs a little bit north of 21 million. As I said, we are using a combination of tax exempt bond financing on the debt side from Virginia housing, in addition to the 4% credit so they will allocate tax credits to us. In return, we take those tax credits, we sell those to a corporate investor. That money is then put into the project as equity to drive down the debt service. That in turn allows us to get to the level of lower rents than would normally be a, uh, make a project work in the area. Um, the other thing too, we're, we have a green designation. We work with the National Green Building Standards. Uh, another big reason why we targeted this area is because this was a HUD federal certified difficult to develop area. So the federal government had determined this is an area that lacks affordable housing. And this is an area where it would be a good location for that affordable housing. Um, again, we set up a single purpose LLC. That's the only piece of real estate they own. And at the end of the day, we would end up managing it. We are certified by VHDA to manage it. Eric, next please. So let's get to the punchline then. I, I, I try to set the stage for what we need in order to partner with you all, the county, in order to make this project work. So what we're proposing is that we would set up a financial incentive or performance agreement with the county. And the way that would work is, for the first 15 years of the project, we would pay real estate taxes based on what the current assessed value is of the property. And then in years 16 through 20, we would ramp up 20% a year until we got full assessment. In return for that, we would put a deed restriction on the property that it must stay affordable for 30 years. So irrespective of whether I'm here, Sean's here, no matter what it is or who owns it, it stays deed restricted for those 30 years. Moreover, what we would do in order, and this is why this is a performance agreement is, and first of all, let me ask Eric, how often do you all pay taxes a year? Once a year, twice, twice. A, twice a year. So what we would do, we would pay the taxes, whatever the full assessed value is with improvements, twice a year, and then, and then we would provide to you all some certification that shows that we have done the affordable housing, as we have said, meaning we have performed in return in 30 days, then you all would then rebate us or provide the incentive back to us for doing that. So as a fiduciary, we have paid the taxes up front on the full assessment. If we don't do what we said we're gonna do, you keep the money. If we do provide the affordable housing, then that money would come back to us as an incentive payment. And that's the way it would work for the first 15 years. And then pro rata till it gets 100% assessment in year 16 through 20. So, okay, next slide then, please, Eric. So I did a summary here, and this is some information I provided before. And we also had a detailed spreadsheet how it worked for each year. I think what this shows is, and we, the comparison we did is, okay, if the property stays 
as it is now for the next 30 years, so we've got to compare this on a 30 year basis, then the total taxes you receive would be a little bit more than $400,000, assuming there's no increase. And then if it, the full assessment, it would be a million six. So the difference would be the million two is what you would, would be the difference that you would end up paying. So as you can see, the investment would be, or the equity that the locality would have in this would be that you would make more money over 30 years with the affordable housing, which does not take into account whatever the value is of providing the affordable units for the locality, okay? So next slide, please, Eric. So the other thing that we, it, it's hard for us to monetize at this point. I mean, it would take some type of, of, of detailed study by someone that's a higher pay grade than me. But of course, there's other things that are created here. We've got jobs created from construction. We've talked about real estate taxes, uh, water and sewer utility fees. I'm not sure if that goes to the county or, or if you all do something different, but a lot of times it is. That, that would be awkward, um, Virginia. Um, personal property taxes, permits, and then of course the ripple and stabilize effect that it would have from having those 124 units. And all of this is above and beyond the people that we are housing that you all have demonstrated or said there's a need for in the county. Next slide, please. Also, this is a, uh, Housing Forward is a nonprofit group in Virginia that what they do, they have an analysis where they go in and say, okay, what is the impact of a new project in an area? And you put in how many units you're doing, what the estimated cost is. Again, I'm not sure exactly how the program works, but it, what it ends up doing is spitting, up, spitting out an economic impact over the short term and long term. And again, I'm not gonna sit here and read all these numbers to you, but the bottom line is it clearly demonstrates you know, that jobs are created and income is produced in the area. So I think it's a positive fiscal attribute to the county. And then um, building examples, uh, I, I, when I did the presentation before, that was that without the benefit of any of you all that went to visit some of our sites. Um, there, next slide. And th this just gives a representation of the type of product we would build. And one thing I wanna make perfectly clear and this has happened over the years, especially when you look back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, if someone said they were doing affordable housing, or I'll use the term that I don't like at all, so-called low income housing, that it would look substantially different from any other type of housing or market rate housing. But what I wanna make clear, if any of you all went to visit our properties, I would certainly say that you would drive up to any of our properties and not know that there's an income range or who lives there or whatever. And, and that's something we're very proud of. And I think that's one reason we've been fortunate to win some state, local and national awards over the years, because at the end of the day, the management is what's really, really important. You've got to be able to manage these things and run them. And we take great pride in that. So next, next slide, Eric. This is just some more uh, just slides of, of projects out there. Next, Eric. Is, is this Brookdale? This is not Brookdale. This is one over in Waynesboro. Brookdale does not have a pool. Okay. The reason I put this in there is because, like I said, we're going to have a pool right. in this one should we go forward. Um, and then I don't know if there's any more or not. Yeah, I think that's it. So I, I appreciate you letting me speak a few more minutes in 10 minutes. I, I try to get through as quick as possible. But with all that, I'm here to answer any questions that you all might have. Andy, if I would ask, you have affordable housing is between $925 and $1,500. To me, I still think that's a pretty good rate. Yeah, I, I'm not arguing with you at all. So compare, Mr. Weaver, let, let, let's, say, let's say we go to Charlottesville, which is in the same MSA or statistical area that you work on. If uh, the average one bedroom for this type of construction is over $1,300 for rent, okay? A two bedroom is gonna be over 1,500 and a three bedroom is gonna be somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000. So I, usually what we see is there's probably a two to $300 uh, less apartment. And that's clearly comes, what that comes from is the tax credits. Because as I said, what the tax credits enable me to do is to borrow less money. And since we have less debt service, we're able to get there. But in a, in a case like this, and I don't wanna get, I don't want to get bogged down too much in how the tax credits work, but there are two types of tax credits. A, a full tax credit, which is called the 9% tax credit, 
which you have to compete for. And then when you compete, the way VHDA has set this up, the only way you can get those credits is to skew your rents down to 50 and 40% of the, of the area median income. And when we did our market study here, that's not what this shows. And based on your comprehensive plan, you all wanted people less than 80, but it seemed like in that range where you still meet the job levels that I showed earlier. So then you have a 4% tax credit, which is half the number of credits, but you automatically get those if you utilize tax exempt bonds over on the debt side. And that's what we're doing. So we're, we don't have to compete for the credits. We'll get credits, but we get half as much as we would get if we were in the competitive range, but we're able now to go to incomes that are a little bit higher. So that's why we're coming to you today. The only way we can make the debt service coverage work on this is during that time period, if we have a reduction on the expense side, which is the real estate tax side, we can then get our debt service so it will cover that debt and we can get the loan. So it's a combination of tax credits, of uh, money from VHDA, plus I hope in this case, also some form of this performance agreement where we're able to get a reduction in taxes in order to enable us to borrow the money that we need to complete the project. Or we're not able to put a community center in, you're not able to do a pool, or you're not able to do the quality of housing that we would want to do. So I'm not saying $950 is not a lot of money. You're exactly right. One of the things I find when we look at this that, that's not taken into account, someone may say, well, I've got an area, I, I, can, I can live somewhere for $750. But a lot of times what we find is where they're living for $750 is quite frankly, substandard as far as housing, right? It's an apartment that's 35 or 40 years old, or it's a, a trailer or something that when they go to pay the utility bill, it's running $300 a month to heat it versus maybe $80 at our apartment complex, it's new. So th there's a lot of nuances there without getting into too much detail, I hope you asked your question, but that answered your question, but that's the way the market worked on affordable housing versus market rate. It's usually two to $300 less. It's been my experience. It also says the comparison in taxes paid over a 30 year period is $416,000 versus $1,684,000. Yes, sir. And that was, um, in fact, Eric, I don't know if it was a spreadsheet that you were ever shared with uh, the board or not. Yeah, I think I, I shared it with the last, with the, with the original package. Yeah. We've yeah. seen this once before. Yeah, so. So, so. so are we saying that the county would lose the difference over that period of time from 416 to 1.684? It, yeah, the 1.2 million is, is, is what is we what, would lose 1.2 in taxes. Yes, assuming that's and again, assuming that, everything was that way. That's assuming that that the property is being assessed as it is as 100%. Correct. That's what it's worth. And but then, yeah, not only do we have to overcome that, we have to overcome education of children, we have to take care of law enforcement. That's what that extra money helps to do to take care of, and we would be short of that. And I would consider affordable housing being any place from $600 to $800 as far as affordable housing. I know people that, that rent in that range, and I know there's not a lot of them, but I do know areas where they do, and are they perfect? No. But, but this way, we're taking away money from the taxpayer and putting it someplace else, and, and yet the people who occupy there are not paying their fair share in education, law enforcement, and, and a lot of other amenities that goes with being a citizen of Cuban County. Yeah, and if I could speak to both of those, I think, so what this chart is saying is, if you look at this performance agreement, then if you left it as is and nothing was built, the, the taxes would be 416,000 a year. Right. If you did the performance agreement, Okay, and, and you work with us to provide the affordable housing, you would get a million six eighty four right over the thirty years. Okay, so the difference there, the one point two, is the difference between doing nothing and doing the project with this performance agreement. That that's the difference. Now, to answer your, uh, I think to speak to your second point there, um, we we can't build new construction for six hundred eight hundred dollars a month. 
It's absolutely not possible. I don't know anybody that can do it. So, I mean, I, I say that not to be argumentative at all, no, but just to, just to state the fact. You're you know? correct, but, but it does go on all the time here in Duvan County. Yeah, um, I, I haven't, I, and I'm not gonna argue that point at all. I'm, I'm not I arguing mean, with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it, but I can't, we can't put together a new complex with amenities and this sort of thing. That. Yeah, to, to make I agree it work. With you. Yeah, so so all, all good points. I, I just want to tell you what we're proposing and how we could get there. All right, so correct this for me because I want to make sure I understand this chart. Through years one through 30, if we agree with your performance thing, we're going to be paid one point, roughly 1.7 million. Correct. My biggest fear, and I, was, I went up to, I tried to look at apples and apples. I drove up to, I don't remember Weir's the name cave. of it. Where's Cave? Where's Cave? I okay. drove up to Where's Cave. Yes, and, sir. And just spent an afternoon walking around and trying to talk to folks. And uh, was very impressed with the parking lot and everything else. I mean, you ride around and everything's taken care of. And got to sit down with the, uh, I can't remember, said manager or the assistant manager. And was very informative. When you did that plan up there, did you do the same performance evaluation with them that you're asking us to do to take the 30 year leap of faith or the 15 year leap of faith? No, sir. And the reason we didn't is because we used the 9% tax credit and all of those tenants there are at 40 or 50% of the area median income. There are none at 60, there are none at 70, which at that point, <sighs> that takes away that income chart of some of the people I said with salaries, they make too much to live there. Right. That, that, that's the issue. And also, you know, that project now is pushing 15 years. And at the time, it, for whatever reason, cost-wise, it was different than what we have now. But now to take it a step further, if you take that same project and fast forward over 10 years <coughs> and you go to the one in Charlottesville, the Brookdale, which is went up there as well. Yeah, which, which that one is set up that way. It uses the Virginia housing on the financing. It uses the 4% credit and we have a performance agreement with Albemarle County. So it is structured just like we're proposing here. So the one with Albemarle is exactly like this. Exactly like this. That is correct. How, the pool. how old is Brookdale? I went there too. Uh, maybe three years old. I thought it Tops? was relatively yeah. new. It's newer, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. William, can you can you talk about one thing? One thing that was brought to my attention there, there's a there's a discussion about the assessment of the property for yeah. for affordable housing. There's there's a code section fifty eight point one thirty two nine five talking that affordable housing units could be um, could be assessed at a lower based upon the expenses of the affordable housing complex. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that would no, that's a good question. So. What that is and what we found over the years, and I say we, people in the housing industry, is that any type of income producing property should be valued as income producing property. Okay, and that, that goes to the point of when you look at our project, you can't tell if it's market rate or if it's affordable. So if the rents in a market rate project for a two bedroom or 1500, I'm just using an example, but because you have tax credits, you're only paying 900 or 1,000, then the income level, if you did, if, if you put a capitalization rate of 6% or whatever on it, the value of it would be less than if it was a market rate project. So what was happening, projects were not, would be in value, not on the income side, but on the cost approach, okay? So all that, all that law said is, just like any income producing property, you have to value it on the income made. And for example, what we utilized when we did this performance agreement, we put a value of close to 100,000 a unit on the affordable side. If that was a market rate, it would probably be 150 or 175,000. So I wanna be clear, we've already discounted that, so to speak, in our analysis that's here, Eric. So, so, so just looking at it, I just wanna make sure that the board's aware and to be clear that if, if the county were to move forward and provide a tax incentive, you're not able to discount the or, or or reduce the assessment of the property. No, no, I, I can't reduce it. Your assessor would yeah. come in and we would provide at the end of the year what our income and expenses yeah. were, just like you do on any of them. And, and and they would look at it and say, okay, here's what they made. Here's they put the cap rate on it and they value it that way. Yes. There's no special way that we can say because it's affordable, you can't pay taxes. But by definition, because you are earning less on your properties, 
the assessed value goes down. It's going to be less. Yeah. That's exactly That's right. right. It's going to be less versus, you know, if it's market rate, but, uh, but in this case, we can't charge $1,800 a month or 19 or whatever in, at this location over there. So the location is such that that's why this works as an affordable project, because that's based on our market study, that's what should go there based on the incomes and everything here. The um, cost, the estimated cost is $21 million, but the estimated value of stabilization is $12 million. That's a little confusing. Yeah, yeah. So that goes back to the point of why you have tax credits. So if, if we say, if, if we put up there that the, the value is 12 million and it costs us 21 million to build, you would never have affordable housing without tax credits. That's an excellent question. And most people don't recognize that. The only reason you have affordable housing is because of this subsidy from the government where they allocate tax credits to you that you can sell. And the corporate investor, for example, it's a dollar for dollar tax credit. So if the corporate investor buys them for 85 cents on the dollar from us, they're going to make that 15 cent spread and that sometimes equates to a seven or eight percent return for them. That's why they buy the tax credits. But the only way they get those tax credits is if we house the people we're supposed to house. So we have to guarantee that we're going to do that, or the IRS is going to come back and want those tax credits back. But you're but you're exactly right. And that's that's you, you picked up on it. There would never be, it costs more to build affordable housing than it's worth if you don't have the tax credit subsidy to do it. I hope that answered your question, but yeah, it, it looks a little weird when you're looking at it, right? It does. Yeah. yeah. So the, the utilities is water and sewage is aqua? Uh, yeah, up there would be aqua, aqua Virginia. Do they have enough capacity? There's, there's some issues we would have to talk about with aqua Virginia regarding uh, a, a potential residential complex. And I don't know, Mr. Miles, do you have any um, yeah, we we talked to uh, ship engineering, just like uh, engineer. Yeah. yeah, so there 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 are some current uh, fire flow and fire suppression issues going on there, and we'll let uh, Keith Smith and Justin Chen know that. So um, if you all are aware of that. That is that has nothing really to do with the with the, the rental prices because that's going to be uh, adequate water and sewer supplies are going to be a, a prerequisite to any kind of well yeah for them for them to get a CO it would it would, it would be required. Um, I have an observation about the. Uh, the current taxes that they would pay the early the thirteen thousand eight seventy five that uh, will cover one student in our school system, and you know with one hundred and twenty four units you're going to have many students going to the school, so I'm not sure that um, the other uh, residents who are paying taxes should be paying taxes for it's subsidizing the homes. The housing. Well, it's We're just subsidizing this. Taxpayers is. It's yes. You're right. We have a lot of people in this county who um, it's a hard thing for them to make their taxes. We all know that. And I don't know that, that this is a good idea because um, it may not be fair to the other citizens. If, if I, Ms. Eager, if I could comment on that, and, sure. and, and certainly um, that, that would assume that anybody who lives in that apartment now, they're not already living in the area and they're not already going to school here, right? So, and, I, and we've just found that's usually not the way it works. I'm not saying there wouldn't be somebody new that moved here that didn't have kids, but you, you know, when we do our market study, it's pretty much within a 10 mile radius. And that assumes that most of these kids are already there. And I'm not arguing with you, but many times those kids are already here and you're, you're schooling them. They're already going to school anyway. So just. Just and our enrollment is, has been dropping too in the school system. So, mm -hmm. I, and I yeah. look at this as the fact that, as as a Moselle Booker speaking, as a member on the board, I should be looking after all citizens in this county to make sure that we have affordable housing for people. 
and and whatever we have to do. And I think we will do things in a smart way, but we just can't leave out people just because the school system may go up or they may not pay taxes or whatever it is. These are our citizens and we need to do as much as we can to make sure that they are living in decent apartments because we have people living place. They have no other choice. And there are so many people that still won't be able to afford to get into these, but it, it's a start. I'm just concerned. I was concerned about utilities because we know what we hear about the water and the sewage um, at Lake Monticello. I don't know if that's changed any. It has not changed. It hasn't cheap. changed. It's very expensive. It's expensive. So we need to consider that as well. Is that going to stay affordable? Um, is that part of the calculation? Oh, sorry to interrupt. But is that your the the cost that the ten, the tenant would have in terms of utilities and water and sewer? Is that part of the calculation of yes. affordable housing? Yes. So how so, does that work? As Ms. so we had to. Out? I mean, we have to factor in the utilities that we pay from Aqua, or whoever the group is, and then what happens? We create a utility allowance for each uh, for each two and three bedroom unit. We have to get a third party consultant, and so a utility allowance for a two bedroom may be a hundred dollars, right? For a three bedroom would be one thirty or one thirty five. So whatever the maximum rents we could charge, whatever the rents, we have to subtract that utility allowance. So when you see the rents we've shown, that's the net rent mm -hmm. that someone pays after subtracting the utility allowance. And okay. That's how we. Incorporate that into what so we're that, doing. That includes so thirteen so or nine hundred fifty dollar rent includes the Correct. water uh, costs. Right. So we, that, that's exactly right. So well, they would still pay it un, okay. unless, yeah, or we wouldn't give them that allowance, right? So if the maximum rents are a thousand bucks and our utility allowance for a two bedroom is a hundred dollars, which includes water, electric, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then we would subtract that if they have to pay it. If we're paying the water. Then we would, then that utility allowance would probably reduce from $100 to 50. Okay, so it's an allowance, and and so if they're paying it, we have to subtract it from the rents, whatever that allowance is. That we have to come up with that allowance or get it certified every year with VHDA. I see. Okay, so if if for whatever, to, I, I think the question is, if next year water rates went up, then our utility allowance, excuse me, would also increase, which would lower the rents. Right, because the allowance would get greater because right. rates have gone up. And and if the allowance is a hundred and they spend a hundred and fifty, then they're responsible for that additional fifty. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. If they do, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. Which that would only be a case. Well, I mean, if, if if all of a sudden someone is inviting all their friends over to do laundry every night. Right. Right. I mean that which they wouldn't do, and that's why it's an allowance, because ultimately they have to still pay for the water after we've reducted. Mm -hmm. or deducted what a normal allowance would be for that unit. I, I hope that answered your question. I, mean, I understand at the lake that those utility costs sometimes are very high, especially on the water. I hear 150, more than that even, which shocks me. But, uh, you know, that's that's pretty hard to swallow, too. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, and then, exactly. Tony, you know. Oh, yeah, we pay about 125 to 150, depending on the one. And that's water. just for water. That's just water not, and sewer. Not power or sewer. Yep. Yeah, it's just water. That's water and sewer. Okay. Right. Um, you have your power on top of that. Yeah, power, of course. of course. Trash is included, so we don't have to worry about that. You got your homeowner's fees as well, too. I didn't hit your three. homeowner's <laughs> fees as well. All right. Yeah. Um, this is Mike Sheridan. The one thing I would caution us about doing is talking about school enrollment and going down with the pandemic because we have a lot of kids left and went to private schools for this year that I've already heard of good majority of them are coming back next year. So this coming August, it's going to be interesting to see if we're back in school five days a week, how many kids we have enrolled. Well, that would be my only thought about that. I know that our numbers are way down this year because we had a lot of kids that left and went to the private schools that are nearby. Because yeah. those private schools were in-person learning. Right. 
uh, and, and didn't have the rules that we go by. Uh, so I think the high school is probably the place that it, that kept the enrollment before the pandemic. They were at close to fifteen hundred, but the elementaries, I don't think they were at full capacity. So, but so, anyway, it will affect. A couple of thoughts and questions still too. Um, you know, I, I like the point that you made about not all of them are new people. And it's fair to assume that we will have some new people, but there might be people that are moving out of, you know, possibly homes that aren't as nice and, and apartments, you know, might provide less work in terms of maintaining the place and so on. So uh, I suspect that we'll have, you know, folks that are, you know, probably a mix of elderly and low income uh, uh, as well in that in that spot. And I think one of the things that is important to note that when we have affordable housing and it brings in a diverse group of people that it it really makes that development in that community a better place where you know everybody is looking out for each other in a little different way than when you really have a place that is not well managed um, and doesn't have a balanced space of people living there. Uh, and that's a cost that you know potentially the community, you know, the county could incur if it had what we would think of as was put earlier, low income housing, uh, I suspect, you know, maintaining some of the areas, which we really call projects in Charlottesville are quite expensive uh, in terms of the overall cost for the county uh, or for that, for the city in that case. Uh, so there is a, there is a breakdown in terms of how much is new versus old, as well as how much is the cost of not doing a good job. Um, and that's just a thought for the board to think about but the second thought that comes to mind is, or the second the question that I have is really, if if the board decides that you know it doesn't want to provide the tax credit, I think you alluded to the fact that that would change, you know, some of the investments that you would make into the property. But it didn't sound like you would not go forward with the project. So is the question if we don't get this, we don't go forward? That's correct. That's probably a yes. Okay. Yeah. And I noticed that you. Build, also build luxury apartments? I'm sorry? You also build luxury apartments? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Okay. Absolutely. But um, this is Patricia Eager. Uh, but do they um, also get this tax break? No, absolutely not. And, and, and that's, and, and Ms. Eager, that's why we have the higher rents to, because we have more debt service because we didn't have the tax credit equity to put into the deal to, you know, to drive the debt down. And that's a whole key here. Um, is your company a private company? Yes. Okay. Um. I'll just say one other thing about my trip across the mountain. One of the things that caught my attention the most was when I was talking to the manager and it spoke volumes to me about your company um, was the fact that you said they've been open for 15 years. Pretty close. And they said the same property manager, not uh, maintenance, the same guy was in charge of maintenance was still there. And, you know, to me, usually I've worked in the school systems for 33 years. You know, a lot of times you get people that are shifting around in that type of stuff, job. And that spoke to me that he'd been there for 15 years and was still there. The most important position in, on the management side, and I don't say that to anybody else, it's a whole lot more important than I am even, but um, to get the good maintenance personnel is the key and to keep them. So, I take that as a compliment. Uh, that Thank was meant that way. Thank please. you very much. Please take it that and, way. And, and board members, I'm not going to provide any commentary on, on, the, on the tax incentives, but but regarding the company themselves, I talked to one of my counterparts in another county where they have uh, pinnacle projects in there, and they spoke very highly of 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 their projects and their property management. They had um, some commercial, and they had one of these. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they had tax incentives. They they did not have tax incentives. But again, they spoke highly of the quality of of the property management and the work of Pinnacle. So thank you. So yeah. are there other and this is Tony O'Brien uh, other performance agreement models that we can look at? Yes, we do, and we we'd be glad to share them, with Mr. Payne, or however you all want to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. We I would, for example, the one we're using now tomorrow. I would just give you a copy of that. I, I've, I've sensed that the board is, you know, kind of at a fence with this. And as you stated, you would not move forward without some sort of a performance agreement. Um, so it might be useful and instructive for the board to have 
some different options there. Yeah, and I guess what we would ask tonight is that if maybe if, if you all, and Eric, I'm not I'm not making the motion, obviously, but yeah. if you all would approve this concept, then we have the ability to work administratively with uh, Mr. Payne and Eric to to come up with a performance agreement that ultimately you all would have to approve, but one that I hope I trust you would if we've done this for all the localities. Yeah, so 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 tonight, and, and to answer your question, and Mr. we're not doing motions, we're just yeah, doing exactly. head nods yeah, tonight. Yeah, right. No, and, 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 and tonight, like I said, we didn't we didn't want staff to go through the legwork of creating documents when we don't know if the board's interested in going in this way. So if the board has an interest in doing this in some fashion, then you know, Mr. Payne and, and this and, this you now know what's being proposed and the the uh, agreement would need to reflect what, what is being proposed or whatever you all would prove. And, and uh, Mr. Dahl is exactly right. We don't want to go you know, drafting multi-page documents and then have the board say we're not interested in this, in this concept. I mean, personally, you know, I struggle with it because I do share some of the concerns that, you know, Mrs. Eager and Mr. Weaver and, uh, you know, don't know exactly where Mr. Sheridan is on it right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, the county is, um, you know, always looking to, to, to make sure that it's providing the best value for all of its citizens and, and keeping its costs to the taxpayer as well as possible. Uh, but I do think that there is a need in the county for this type of a property uh, and that provides this type of a service. Uh, whether that need is that we have to you know, subsidize for 15 years or 10 years or 20 years and how that looks is, is you know, something that, again, I think would be more, provide more flexibility for the board to make the decision personally. Is that something you could provide to us? Well, you just said he would. No, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Because that would make it a lot, give us a lot more information. Like I said, I was very impressed with both properties that I went to. Um, I spent the day riding around and it, it was, well kept. I like the fact that when he, the young lady even told me, you know, the, she walks the parking lot and if there's cars that are sitting there that are not functioning two weeks after two weeks, they're saying, okay, time to fix it or move it. Well, that's good to hear. Cause I don't always get all the feedback. Well, I, I can tell you right <laughs> now when I, I, I drove around the parking lot before I stopped and talked to her and anybody I saw outside, I stopped and talked to them. And that was another thing to me that left me feeling really good because everybody I stopped and talked to is three different people. All had positive things to say. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. And Mr. O'Brien, I just wanted to go back to one of the comments you made. One of the things that really interested, interested us as a company is that this, uh, the multifamily portion isn't sitting out there on an island all by itself in the woods, that it was part of this larger community. And that's something you just brought up. And I, I, I think, and then you add in the commercial and it's where that new uh, traffic circle mm -hmm. is. I mean, that sure. that's what, or quite frankly, if it had been just sitting at that traffic circle by itself, we wouldn't be here tonight. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that encouraged us to be part of a larger community. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I've, been, I've never lived in an affordable housing or a low income housing place, but I think that there often is a, a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways to do it poorly. Uh, and Overton McGee, who, who's part of uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, knew about Pinnacle and knew its reputation uh, in the affordable housing market and said it was very good. Uh, but I, I do know that if you can have a mixed community, it really is to the benefit of everybody and not to segregate uh, you know, folks that can't afford to live, but to actually have them living within the same community is really positive. Uh, so that's just my thought. Alrighty, um, so Ms. Eager, what do you think? We were able to provide us with some other options. Um, we also have heard from the Methodist Church and they were interested in doing low-income housing across from the lake. And uh, I asked, "Are you going? do you have to have a tax break? And they said, no. So, you know, I'm, I, I can't support this knowing that other people are, are uh, Actually, that we subsidize. Our taxpayers are subsidizing this, and I have lived in low-income housing a long time ago, 
but uh, and I remember it, but uh, you know, it, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> I don't know. It was in Philadelphia and then again in Cleveland. Ms. Boker? I think it's time for us to uh, do this multifamily. And um, I think this is an opportunity that uh, I wouldn't want us to pass it up. Mr. Brown? Yeah, I think that, uh, I, you know, I, I do think that we, we need this type of property and, and we need, um, you know, Colonial Circle would be a great success. Mm -hmm. I think it will bring nice. a lot of tax revenue. I'm concerned about the current performance agreement as presented, but uh, mm -hmm. overall, I, I think having Colonial Circle move forward is really important. And I, you know, I suppose that, that you know, if we were looking at the 9% tax credit instead of the 4% tax credit, that, you know, would be a way to do it as well too, but that would change the nature of the property overall as well too. So you got to balance that yeah. uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, that, that may affect the values of the other properties that are being proposed to be put in there, which are not part of this and which would then in turn reflect in the assessment values that you would have for those other properties. So I think there is a balance balancing act here, but I'm in favor of exploring this further. Mr. Weaver. It always goes back to the tax credit. They seem like they end up at the bottom of the totem pole over time. And uh, I, I think if, if they would go ahead and not have the discount and could justify some way that they take care of all the other costs that they have to take care of, such as education, fire and rescue, and law, that would that would be fine. But the they're always needing somebody else's money to make it work. And in, in real life, that doesn't happen. It only happens in government. So, so I'm certainly not overly happy that we're going to put the taxpayer down again, which they're usually at the bottom of the pole. So that's about where I am. Well, I, I'm like Mr. O'Brien. I'd like to look at the other options if possible. And uh, so if y'all can put some stuff together and get it to Mr. Payne, yeah. they can get it out to us. So Mr. Chair, I guess, I guess maybe it would be helpful to know, and, and I don't know if you can talk about this kind of on the fly like this. I mean, is there, is there a, is there a, maybe a different model that we could maybe set up um, and I know we're talking about that, but if there's some parameters kind of already in place right now that we could discuss to, to come back to, or, or I mean, if not, we could just come back with a bunch of different options and then see what the board wants. Yeah, I, I think what I'll do is, is I can send, I, I think the easiest thing would be to send what we used in Albemarle to, to you all, and then let you look at that. And then we can discuss from there. I, I, I just don't know what other parameters I can set what, at this moment. What is, yeah, but, but, um, Excuse me, in Moselle. You're talking about Brookdale? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm talking about the performance yeah. agreement. And you we said use. that's a real AX. I yes, went out there. there. Um, so, what's different about what plan or what is different about that one? Is it similar to this? That you yes, ma'am. That, that's us? wrong. It, okay. We, yeah, state another way, I guess we would just take Brookdale and bring it here. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, well, no, I guess that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get okay. at. Yeah. Uh, the, the concern is from the board that that maybe the tax incentive in its current form that you're presenting, which is all morals, in fact, is maybe not to the to the level that the board wants to go to. So is there a different tax financial incentive level, a lesser one that could be achieved in doing a project like this? Uh, I would say right now, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and board, is that is that kind of the question you're asking? Yeah, that was, that's, yeah. yeah. And that's a fair question. Yeah, it's legitimate. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I hate to say it this way, Albemarle's pockets are just a little bit bigger than Savannah's pockets. And yeah. They, but they, yeah, but they have different I mean, issues. I, than what they have. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in the way you described it, Mr. Park, you know, different models, different assets, different, you know, I, I think you tried to, work within the comprehensive plan as we had addressed it uh and you have to reach that 60 percent goal i understand that um but you know that that does that does that mean that if we do a 15 year and then you know the other 15 years you're taxed at the full rate at that point in time does that mean that there's no clubhouse there's no pool that, that those are the kinds of things that i'm really yeah, that, saying 
and, and, um, yeah, it's and, it, and I'm not saying that that's not a, those aren't good things to have and doesn't make the marketing of the property more attractive, but perhaps it's, you know, what the board is willing to accept right now. Yeah. So let me, I, I kind of explain where, where that kind of this concept of it's 15 years and you ramp it up gradually because what's going to happen, of course, we have to get it financed, right? So, and then we're going to get the first question is going to come to me is okay, how do we go from year 15 to 16 and go from zero to 100%? How is that going to happen? And so, what we have to show that over the years that the property has appreciated while we're paying down debt service, okay? And then what happens as we're gradually ramping it up over those next five years, that we're able to then take that lower debt and then recast it out for another 25 or 30 years. So let's say we borrow 10 million and by the time we get to year 15, we only owe 6 million, then we'll go out and recast that debt for another 25 or 30 years. So now our debt service, our monthly debt service is down lower than what we were paying. And that's gonna make up the difference now, the higher taxes we're paying. So that's a scenario I have to go through with the financing agencies. And, and the reason I, we've been able, this kind of game plan that, so to speak, that we use tonight, we've been successful with them in the past doing it. And if we if we try to shorten it, then I've I've not been able to show how we're really able to make that work. I, I, if I, that's a long-winded way of maybe answering it, but I can't I can't say if if in year sixteen we went to forty percent, that would mean you can't get a pool. I, I I can't I can't get it to that level, right? I, I'm kind of dealing with what I have sure. today. And, but as you just described it yourself, if you if you if you pay down and then refinance the remaining debt at that point in time, you've created the income stream already. That's reduced your cost. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, the county is is a partner with you in this project, and so therefore now the county is trying to receive more of its component. You know, so yes, you're not making as much profit per se. I understand that, but likewise, as has been put out by the the rest of the board, there is this shared component of, you know, asking the rest of the taxpayers who are subsidizing this, uh, who, are the, who are the partners with you yeah. to, to get that recovery a little bit faster. So and I think you made some very good points about how it's not all just, you know, new kids uh, all running in going to the schools there. It's not necessarily that our tax burden is going to go up significantly because of these, uh, because of these units here. Uh, I think you, you did make some good points there. And I think when you look at the rest of the costs that are maybe involved in not having quality, affordable housing, uh, it's it's probably not as big in our minds as, as we might think uh, in terms of the overall net cost of not having those additional tax dollars. In. But, you know, if, if the board said, hey, we'll do 15 years, but that's it, you know, what does that mean, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I can't answer that tonight. Right, and that's why we're letting you guys talk about that, right? Okay. No, uh, and that's a fair yeah, question. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, I'm certainly willing to discuss that with Erica, whoever, yeah. if any, any of you all want to call me individually or meet sometime, I'm certainly glad to do that too. I just, you know, tonight was kind of an informational session and that's why I'm here to answer any questions and continue to answer questions, right? If, if other ideas yeah. come up with questions, I'm, I'm glad to do it. So I, I, just, I, I just appreciate it. If you all would consider. I just have, excuse go ahead, me, go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Booker, no ma'am. Um, um, Kelly, when we did our, Ms. Mosell speaking, we did our survey. Do you remember if the community was concerned about affordable housing? I would have to look back at it okay. again, but yeah. I don't think it was one of the higher priorities, higher but I think it kind of fell under right. affordability in general. Sure. And another thing that I was thinking is that we really need to think beyond and talk about the benefits of this affordable housing and the people, new people, people who live here that's coming to the county. We are hoping that economically, we're going to have more businesses coming in, restaurants and all of that, um, which, which we've got to think out. I mean, I know we've had to think narrowly and get everything straight, but we also need to think about what's the benefit of it for the health, for people, but also it's for the growth of the, of the businesses and we're gonna get taxes in other ways. Um, we have people now, you know, to come down here to teach and they go to Charlottesville. They're living in apartments in Charlottesville, I'm sure. 
it would be very nice if they could get something close by. And, um, and they're more like Fluvanians because they are among the community and the churches and so forth. Oh, and, so, we have, and we have people who live yeah. in the county already who, you know, <laughs> maybe they're on that fixed income yes. and they now are, and they've now reached an age where they don't want to take care of their property, mm -hmm. and don't want to leave the area. And I, I see this a lot in the lake because we do have a fairly high concentration of folks over 60, 70 years old. And, and I, in my own neighborhood, I've seen so many people come I'd and go. I'd love to go. To uh, but, uh, but I know that some of them would like to be able to stay in the area, but there's really nothing that is the type of property where they could stay in the area. Um, and yes, some of them wouldn't qualify, but many of them would qualify. Uh, so um, I do think it helps to commit. When I talk about well, type of property, I, I think that helps. Well, here's one thing that I was sitting there to myself thinking about, and I know we're talking about the children and the other costs of things of that nature. Uh, if we do a performance thing with real estate taxes, these folks are still going to be paying personal property tax. Mm -hmm. They're still going to be paying sales tax on anything that they buy inside the county. Right. Help me out, guys. Is yes. there anything I'm forgetting? You're right. But I, 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 is there anything well, else? Well, they're they're Wait, supporting the businesses. Well, that's what I mean. They're supporting well, local businesses because it's going to bring people. I'm just trying to look at, sure. trying to weigh the other things. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that this type of development would allow us is these guys that are getting just out of college mm -hmm. that don't have kids yet. It would give them a place to stay. And, and they're right. I mean, I work every day with teachers that drive in from the other side of the airport mm -hmm. in Albemarle and we lose teachers. I know sometimes because of that, we have some that drive in from Powhatan. Some that come from Chesterfield, uh, if we had this housing development where it's located right now, I think we'd see somewhat of a vice versa switch. We'd have teachers that teach at Walton, teachers that teach at Monticello. Mm -hmm. Those schools that are on the eastern side of Charlottesville or southern side of Charlottesville could live, could live in these true. apartments. And you said yourself, an apartment in Charlottesville versus one of these, it's going to be three, four hundred dollars difference, cheaper. Oh yeah. So now we could get some of them to come out here and live instead of driving from Charlottesville to Fluvanna to teach. Well, I have a teacher as a, a tenant. Yes, ma'am. Prior tenant, and she taught in Albemarle for thirty years. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. This would be the same type of deal if you yes. got the right property right. price. Mm -hmm. She lives out here. Yeah, correct. Well, we're here. Okay. Right. I, I want to read this from their report. It says our successful projects include nearly 3,000 residential units consisting of over 3,300 3, square feet and valued at over $400 million. So clearly, whatever they're doing, they're, they're doing quite well at it and it's been very successful for them. So I know so you got to convince me that this really is for the benefit of the uh, uh, people who need affordable housing. Mr. Chairman, can I make an observation? Yes, sir. At the end of the day, there's there as I as I see it, and I'm 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 doing this as a practical illustration rather than a technical. One. There are three public subsidies that are proposed for this project. One is the the tax credits, which is essentially a federal a federal subsidy. The second one that's being asked is the, the rebate of the, the local taxes, which is what the, the principal thing you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. The third one, though, is it goes back to this, this statute that was referred to before, 58.1-3295. Uh, and I don't want to get into the, the weeds of, 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 of uh, tax assessment procedures, but this statute deals with that very issue. And what it does is it prescribes it prescribes the the income method as Mr. Park has told you as being the principal principal way to do this. When in my experience with the, with uh, any kind of tax assessment case, there are three basic uh, basic uh, methods of evaluation. One is cost, one is income, and 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 the uh, the uh, 
The third is uh, comparable sales. And the, those, the importance, the relative importance of those three methods depends on a number of things, one of which is the form of, of the property. So that um, if you, for industrial property, for example, it's rarely going to be sold, so you're rarely going to have very good comparable sales. You'd go through the motions of that, but it wouldn't be the, the best method. The income method would typically be used for an industrial property. For uh, rental property, they, they are, again, not, not sold as often as you would with single family. Single family, you can typically get a number of comparable sales with, within a reasonable time and a reasonable distance. So th that's the preferred method typically for single family. With, re with uh, rental property, they're, they're typically not gonna be, the whole project is not gonna be sold very often. So you can get some figures with comparable sales, but it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, cost is not, not a very good one typically. It's sort of a, a lot of these things are one checks the other. But the income method is, a, is a, a good one for something like rental property, which is generating a, an income stream. The, uh, the real significance of this statute, as I see it, is that it emphasizes the importance of the, the income method, makes it easier to, to apply the income method, and therefore puts less emphasis on the others. And the other thing is that it describes <laughs> certain characteristics that the assessor must include. Now, again, as you all, if you heard me say before, the assessor is not controlled by the board. So the board can't say, go out there and make sure that you take account of, uh, you know, the location or whatever it is. He's going to do that, but it's not up to you to, to determine which of those elements he's going to consider. He has to do that himself. What this statute does basically is it prescribes certain things that, that are required to be considered to the extent that they're reflected in, in, um, in the, the facts. Just for example, if there's a, a rent control, which there would be in this project, uh, if there's a rent control, that's one thing that, that, uh, that has to be considered. So in other words, if you had the project that's being physical project that you're being described here and it's a market rent place that's going to generate let's say fifteen hundred dollars a month per apartment but you have restrictions as is being proposed here to a thousand dollars then that's going to reduce the, the that according to this statute that will necessarily reduce the tax assessment so you're going to that's what i mean by there's there's three subsidies if essentially one of them is the federal subsidy. The second one is in essence, the state subsidy, which is being done secondhand rather than, than cash allowances. It's being done by the application of this statute. And the third one is the, is the tax rebates that you're being asked for. So, um, and I think, I think that also reflects the fact that when you look at that differential, that in fact, they are providing uh, the affordable housing, because obviously you wouldn't build a $21 million building and then not want to be able to recover well, let me, let me put it, your, your, your rents on that, you know, me, accordingly, right? Let me put it to you this way. Let's assume that the, that the federal tax credits are out and that, that the rebate from the county is out. The cost of the project over time, including the tax uh, the difference between a market rate tax assessment and a restricted income uh, tax assessment would be potentially significant. Sure. So that that if you said if you said no, that eliminates the the what I would call the third the third tax uh, ter, um, subsidy, but it it doesn't eliminate the first two. So I, I don't know whether that's helpful to you or not, but I, I thought it would be important. No, and that's a fair point. I mean, you know, what will happen to the Colonial Circle project? We don't know because, you know, we haven't talked, had, you know, input from the developers on it. We're getting input from the Pinnacle Group here. 
Um, but whether there are other people lined up to build this building and uh, as, as non affordable housing, I don't know the answer to. And so that would be you know, something that, that the county would need to assess and say, you know, okay, we say no to this project, which seems like a very worthy project, but we say no. Do we, do we have some other investor that's willing to build apartment buildings in the next few years to get the project moving forward, which is equally important as well too. So that, I think that's you know, one of the challenges uh, as well too. And I, I know that Mr. Smith has been involved in some of those conversations, but I just, you know, he, he's indicated to me that, that this is a, a certainly, you know, you guys, the Pinnacle Group and getting an affordable housing project was kind of a linchpin to getting everything moving forward. Mr. Smith? Yes. Yes. Who is Mr. Smith? Keith Smith. Keith. Keith. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, like I said, we can go back with 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 uh, with wow. Mr. Park and, and discuss it, but I guess the big question, I mean, the big question in, in my eyes is, is if they can't do this project for a lesser incentive, what are what are we what are we moving forward with? What are we negotiating or, or discussing? And and that's I guess that's the thing. If the board's saying as it stands right now, we don't want to do it, well. Then, then we would have to go to to you and see. Well, is is there a lesser incentive that to be offered? And if not, then then that's that's where we are. Opportunity for everybody to think about it. Sure, we can certainly do that. I'm sorry, Cindy, what did you say? I said that's an opportunity for everybody to think about it. Right? Okay. I mean, I I don't think and weigh the options. Right. I mean, I think you've got you know two no's as it stands right now. You've got one yes and two maybes. You know, uh, and so that's, and that's where we one are. thing that you brought up, Ms. Zeger, and that was the church group that was senior affordable living, correct? They were looking at doing senior, just seniors, senior just seniors. Housing. This would be yeah. more of the beginning worker right. type, type opportunity. Mm -hmm. The right. church that you were talking about, yeah, and I, I would imagine because it is religiously affiliated, it's a nonprofit. They, they, they're getting, they're getting yeah. tax breaks so that. That's kind of apples and oranges. But they're not getting well. Would they get a tax break from the county because they're a church? When when we talked with them, no, they were not. They were not requesting a, a financial incentive. Okay. And like well, that, said, that might be a question we need to ask them because we know we have. I hate to say this, but we have one school in the county that's religiously affiliated. Well, let, let me let me point out to you. That's why I wanted to mention this thing about this statute is the constitution requires that taxation be based on on fair market value this statute is easily defensible in my opinion because it doesn't say give it tax it on less than fair market value but consider the things that reduce the fair market value like the restricted rent you know, or uh, whatever it might be now in the case of the 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 religious institution if uh, XYZ Church comes in and says we're going to build a, a uh, an elderly housing project here, and we're going to have limits on the rent and things like that. It would not be tax exempt because the, it is, it's perfectly clear that the tax exemption for for um, for religious entities is directly related to the religious operation. Uh, so. It wouldn't be tax exempt, but it could be reduced in the same way that this statute would do it by by saying, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a deed restriction that limits the that limits the uh, amount of rent below market rent, that has to be considered in coming up with the income method of evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, one last right. thought, and I thought this is very quick. Uh, I think that I don't. I don't know when when is the last time the board was presented with an update on the need for affordable housing in the area. But Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission did do a study just last year around that, and I, I might be instructive yeah. for the board to have somebody come and present uh, so that we 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 have a better sense of, of the you know the needs and the challenges in the in the TJPDC area altogether. Yeah, didn't it? This is mostly I'll speak. Then they go from county to county and meet with us. Eric, were you a part of that or Steve? 
No, I, no, I, I was a part of that. Yeah, yeah they that met was, with me and yeah. talked about affordable. Yeah, they did. They they did their kind of uh, the, survey. Well, they assessment. did the big workshop. They had the big right. kind of conference. I think it was in April of 2019 yeah. uh -huh. is when it occurred. And then within the next year or so, they did the big study. Right. They had the big study that they did regarding the affordable housing and, and talking about uh, you know affordability in the different localities and all that so it, it was a pretty comprehensive study they did it was and since we're considering this kind of project i think it'd be good to be refreshed on it okay. and you can see mr park i apologize we tend to discuss things for an extended period of time every once in a while i like it that's fine well, that's I, I, I hope you take it as in we're we're really looking hard at this i appreciate the input from everyone and uh so does that mean we'll maybe talk a little bit more? Yeah, I think that's that's the direction yes. that I got from the board yes. that, yes. that, that yes. you are not interested in its current format, but maybe something different. No, we, I don't know why we can say Moselle, okay. that we're not interested in this format. I think we just want to explore. It, 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 this again, another, it just gives an opportunity give for a, everybody go to back to the, the drawing board. Right, right. we may end okay. up coming back to that. That's fine. And lastly, if anyone wants to call me directly or wants to meet or talk more individually, I'm, I'm glad to do it. So, and I certainly appreciate the time this evening. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Yes, sir. Next up is F, Sheriff's Office Training Summary, Major Wells and Sheriff Hess. And gentlemen, when you want me to go next screen, I'll just, just let me know. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, and, and it's the light on. Like, yep. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all real quick. Um, this is kind of y'all's request. So what I have is just a brief PowerPoint presentation, more as talking points. At any point in any of this, if y'all have any questions or concerns, just you know, let me know. Uh, you're not gonna have to interrupt me, stop me in the slide, whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, if one thing leads to another, just feel free to ask me any questions. I wasn't really sure what you were after, so this is kind of just a general overview. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm kind of just going to talk about the types of training we do. You know, the basic training academy is where everybody pretty much starts at. After that, we have field training. Then we do what we call in-service training. We also have what we call roll call training. So those are just repeating trainings that happen twice a week for, you know, they're 10, 15, 20-minute trainings during roll call. And then the biggest type we do is on-the-job training. Next slide. Uh, and as you saw on the photo there, that's actually training in our office that we do our in-service training in our office as well as a roll call training is done in there. It's kind of hard to see by the uh, Zoom stuff there, but that's the last side of state regulation. I don't know how many people realize we're regulated by the state quite heavily. Uh, the Department of Criminal Justice Services. This is just an excerpt straight from their web page. They're basically responsible for certification, kind of like a teacher has to be licensed. All law enforcement officers need to be certified. And to do that, there's certain standards that are both in code and then also the Administrative Code of Virginia with standards we have to meet to maintain. Um, and there's two, like the in-house training, some of that counts for credit, some of it doesn't count for credit. So just like a teacher or any other profession, you have to maintain a certain amount of credit hours per two years to keep that certification. Next slide. This is kind of just a quick overview of the academy. Currently, new recruits who are not certified go to a 22 week long regional academy. Our academy, oddly enough, is in Weir's Cave, top of our last conversation seems. Um, <laughs> It's in-house, it's, it's a residential academy. The state has what they call minimum compulsory training standards. Those are the standards they have to meet to pass the academy. And those are the key topics that are covered in the academy. And again, this is straight from the state website. We cover things such as professionalism, legal issues, communication, patrol investigations, defensive tactics, use of force, driver training and physical training and weapons. During, during this academy, you're are tested on the blocks of instruction that you receive. And at the end of the, of the academy, you take a statewide test, which is a cumulative exam of everything that you've learned. And you also have to pass that. You don't have a job if you don't pass it? Correct. No, you have to pass multiple phases. We'll get to that in the next slide. What is your defensive, Moselle, defensive tactics? What's, what's use of force? 
Oh, you tell her. I actually have a slide just for oh, that. If you can okay. bear with Hold me on. here, we'll, we'll okay. get there. All right. No, no problem. Next slide, please, sir. Um, this is kind of what we just talked about. To get your initial certification, just graduating the academy itself does not make you a certified officer. You have to pass, as the sheriff mentioned, you have to pass the academy completely. There's a state law enforcement exam you have to pass, and you have to pass that at 100%. If you don't, you get one more shot at that apple, you can go back and retest. If not, you're done. And for Mr. Weaver, if you don't pass that, you're of no value to us. You cannot work in this state as a law enforcement officer. So you have to pass that. Not only that, you have to do what's called field training. That's the second type of training that I mentioned. By state mandate, that's only 148 hours of field training you do. We at our office, we do 284 hours of field training. And that has to be done with a state certified field training officer, which means it's a seasoned officer who's completed, again, a state mandated training on field training. So to be a trainer, you have to pass state mandated training to be a trainer. And when you do field training, there's a whole binder essentially with, we call them DORs, data observation reports, that you have to go through and check off that the person could perform these tasks, perform that task, and they're all state mandated tasks. So that's what field training, and until you pass all those, once you do all of this, we submit all your paperwork, send it off to DCGS, they review it, and then and only then are you a certified law enforcement officer. So the field trainer is in our Sheriff Department. We have, He's I don't person. know the number of I think we have three field training officers currently. Okay. And basically what happens is just like learning to do anything else. When field training, you they come out of the academy, you have a lot of book knowledge, but it's not always practical knowledge. You start off as riding along, you know, you're in full uniform, you ride along, and you advance, you start you know, after a while, once you field trainer is more comfortable with you, you kind of start taking the lead on, okay, this is just a past old property for it. You, know, you go ahead and deal with this. I'll kind of stand back and observe. It's kind of a learning by doing type of thing. And then, you know, as you progress, then you get to where you get to drive the car. So just riding the passenger seat. And then eventually the final step of that is we do what's called shadowing the officer. A lot of times you'll be in plain clothes. So that, you know, you'll go on the call with them and kind of stand back. And you have to observe how the officer interacts with people, how they make their arrest, are they following the rules and regulations correctly? Do they know how to talk to people right? And they explain things right. And a big part of our job is communication. If people can't explain all of everything's going on. Again, you know, and we have we have bad people who we'll invest that money, but they can't get through training and they kind of money. Because we can't afford to have this type of, you know, you can't you can't get it. This is a hard job, you can't get it. You might be the best person in the world, but if you're not meant for this type of job and have the correct disposition, if you will, for this type of job, we don't want you to stand. Next slide. <clears throat> the next kind of continuing phase, you know, once you get through the initial phase, you know, like I passed field training many, many years ago, but you still have to do state mandated in service training. And currently, the state minimum is 40 hours every two years, which to me is not sufficient. Uh, we do much more than that in our office, but this is clearly just I wanted to point out what the state mandates. And they have it broken down. You have to get your hours in these categories, you know, 34 hours, what they call career development which is just kind of general fields. You have to have two hours of culture diversity every two years. And those are state mandated topics. Uh, the combo can change for every year. Then you have to have four hours of legal updates. You know, our job, we're not, obviously we're not attorneys, but you have to know the law and we all know the law changes habitually. Uh, so it's very important to stay on top of that. Not only just the law, but also we're regulated by case law. You know, what I did 10 years ago is not the same thing we do now because the courts had said, well, that's not acceptable anymore, or that is acceptable. You know, they rule on things to go with kind of the community norms and the way the laws are interpreted. So we have to stay on top of case law. Because like I said, it, what I did today could be fine. If the Supreme Court decides something tonight, then tomorrow that could change. So we have to stay abreast of that constantly. Then also by state <coughs> law, we have to pass a DCGS approved firearms training every year. We typically do it two years. This year, we probably will not because we're still waiting on our ammunition to get here. Um, but we do that every two years too. And that's a state mandated course of fire we have to do. I have a question, Mosel, about cultural diversity. You said you only get two hour trainings every two years? That's the state minimum. State standard. minimum, but we do Currently. more. Yeah, we do more than that. Okay. Um, we do. Um, and I, I'll get to that in a slide, but I get ahead of myself. That's fine too. You know, we do CIT probably 
Ah, shoot. I think we're probably about 70% of officers now have finished crisis intervention. Training. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> and forgive me if I use acronyms. That's kind of the world we operate in. It's a program that's put on statewide with uh, Region 10. Region 10 mental health services, and it's a 40 hour, it's a week long course. So it's just hard for us to get everybody to it, to learn how to interact with people who are having emotional needs, with people who are in distress, people with disabilities. It's a, it's a very good course. Um, so we're working on that one. We go through de-escalation training, uh, you know, of course, like everything else, COVID kind of threw everything out of whack a little bit the last year and a half. But online, it's actually made it somewhat easier because online trainings, and Zoom stuff is easier for us to go to sometimes than having to send the deputy to where's K, that's where our academy is. So we, and it, you know, I monitor the news every morning and when I see something that happened, I go, you know, that's something you might want to look at. When I get to work, I usually go through and try to find, or, or some of our training team, and I'll get our training team here a little bit. We'll go through and try to find an online training because our academy is fairly limited. So we look for other resources, federal resources, things like that. You know, we've talked about positional asphyxia, you know, we talked about, and I'll get into the use of force again, but we talked about, you know, relevant issues that are current. We want to make sure we're training and up to date on that. Like I said, this is habitually changing jobs. Any other questions? Next slide, please. In-house training, and I just call it that because that's basically the training we do in-house. It's not really part of the DCGS minimum mandates, but it's the stuff we decide we need to do on our own. That's kind of what I just talked about. Um, like I said, when I say routinely, we do it whenever we get a chance to do it. We try to do a spring and a fall training sessions um, where we get everybody together to cover, again, whatever topics are relevant, legal changes, um, you know, laws change quite frequently here, especially lately with these special sessions. And it's paramount we stay on top of those changes so we're operating properly. Um, I talked about roll call trainings. Think of those as minimum, kind of as the mini training. You know, shift change, we have roll calls and on Wednesdays and Fridays, we give it together and the training team comes up with some ideas. And again, it's usually based on current events. Um, you know, did we watch a, something on the news that like, we wanna make sure we're not doing that. So we're trying to stay current and on top of those situations. Uh, and they're just easy to do. Even if it's just a 10 minute reminder on, hey, remember we talked about this six months ago, let's just do a quick little 10 minute talk about de-escalation techniques or about use of force about you know the body cameras uh things like that like i said we have an in-house training team that's made up of senior deputies and dcgs certified instructors in this state to be an instructor you have to be certified by dcjs i've been instructor for about 20 years now um same with use of force besides being a regular instructor you also have to be certified in use of force instructor i've been one of those for about 17 years now as well a lot of what we do, you have to be certified to do it. You know, baton instructor, that's the classical baton we carry. You know, pepper spray is a separate instructorship, taser is a separate instructorship. So all those require certification. You just don't go buy a product and start using it. You have to follow the, both the state and manufacturer guidelines, of course, federal regulation. So we're a lot more regulated than I think a lot of people are aware of. And I'm sorry if I'm talking fast, please tell me to slow down if I need to. And maybe I've got things to discuss later as well. So basically what you see in the photo here up in the top uh, left corner, that's a roll call training during the during the middle of COVID where we didn't do any training inside, but we went outside and stood in a circle and talked about the things that, that we needed to cover. The uh, photo below there, you see uh, uh, someone learning how to apply a tourniquet to someone, which our deputies have saved many lives in this county by the use of tourniquets. And then on the right hand side, you see Major Wells is being used as a, as a, a person to practice uh, safety restraining someone. And that actually is a, a use of force training we put on for our reserve unit. Um, and I, I didn't put a slide specifically laid to them in there, but they go through, they don't do the basic training at the academy, but they go through all the other trainings. And we train in house, they go to those trainings. They have their own roll call trainings they go to when we do the large training days. We do integrated training, so they're on par with what we're training on. Those training standards, there's not a DCGS standard for reserve deputies. There is one for auxiliary police, so we train to the DCGS standard for auxiliary police. Um, but these are just a, a very brief example because it's a lot of topics we cover. Like I said, CPR and first aid is a big one. We've had a lot of people that do CPR. Get to the rescue call before the rescue squad can. 
Um, we just had one yesterday. Yeah, we had a gentleman that fell outside and hit his head, and, and one of the one of the deputies came out, was there as, as an EMT, and um, was able to help until the rescue squad came. Right. Earlier this month, we had DSS come over and give all, all the patrol deputies uh, training on you know child interviewing. Uh, and mandatory reporter training. We cover that every year. We work with the shelter for help in emergency to do what's called a lap assessment for domestic violence to try to reduce domestic violence rates. So they'll come out and they'll do roll call trainings for us. The last couple have been Zoom trainings because of COVID, but it's still the information gets out. So we have to cover a lot of topics. Uh, any questions on the in-house side of it? It, it, on the implicit bias side, uh, how, can you describe a little bit more about that? How's that changed? Is anything happening? That is, now? that's one of the topics that's being worked on currently. Uh, I went to the Chiefs of Police Conference uh, last month uh, because we didn't have Sheriff's Conference in the fall. I went to theirs to get this training, and DCJS was there at the time, and they covered all the topics that I'll uh, that I'll tell you about in a few minutes, but. At that time last month, they still could not tell us definitively what is going to change, how it's going to change, because they're still in the process of vetting it uh, through uh, the process that they have. But the minute they do complete that, then they will send it out to us, and then we'll have to re retrain and readapt to whatever changes they make. Hopefully, I see. I, I hope to see that they will increase some of the amounts of time that you have to spend on some of these trainings. So I think. Not only will the verbiage change, but uh, hopefully the, the number of hours will change that you have to have. And the relationship between sort of the mandated training and the in house training, how much, you know, are you reinforcing or are it's you probably adding value? It's probably more than we do in house that we're not mandated because you saw the state standards. And last year during the police reform bills, I testified before the General Assembly on what I thought would be good changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can always do things better. Like anything, any profession, any person, you can always self-improve and self-analyze. You know, you said, mentioned implicit bias. That is really not a new concept. We've been training on that for years. You know, as cultures and everything changes, we go with the flow to learn what the current trends are. But, you know, we're well aware that we're all human beings and we all carry our own baggage with us and we train that. And the key thing is you need to overlook that. And, you know, I always tell people the easiest way is to treat them like a grandma. Bottom line, everybody loves a grandma. Just treat them like that. Don't care what they do, what they look like. Just treat them like that. And that's, I know it's oversimplification, but you know, it's an easy way for me to reinforce something in five minutes to somebody. Um, you know, same with culture diversity. We've talked about that. I've been doing this for 24 years plus now. I actually started as an auxiliary police officer for two years before that. And training has come a long way. In, those 26 years, I can tell you that. And we focus a lot more on, you know, not, I don't say not arresting people, but no, we, we, we don't want to use force, we don't have to use force. If we can find alternatives to a lot of situations, we look for those alternatives. 20 years ago, it wasn't always quite that way. You know, it was a lot more with police and we're here to take care of things. You know, we're, you know, we're community caretakers. Um, I went to the FBI Academy about five years ago, spent three months at Quantico training. Uh, you actually stayed in their barracks. People from across, not just the country, but across the world. It was a very good opportunity to learn how other countries do things and how other areas do things. So we were able to bring a lot of that back. So I was very fortunate to do that. You know, I talked to a guy from uh, London, London to Bur in England, I think it was actually Birmingham, learned the you know, kind of English model, they call it policing by consent and the guardianship model. So we started trying to integrate that into what we do as well. You know, I roomed with a captain from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, learned a lot from him. Uh, so that was a very good experience. And those are things we can all bring in. And I got a slide about that. Most of our senior management has been to some sort of federal level training. So I'm probably getting ahead of some of my slides, so forgive me. Next slide. Uh, the use of force. And this is, I teach use of force every year, cover it with all our deputies to cover current case law. Like I said, I've been the main use of force defensive tactic constructor for 17 years, 15 years here at this office. Those are some of these, you know, I've got 50 <clears throat> slides or more that we can I do use of force lectures that we cover. It goes into case law. This is just a quick, you know, excerpt on that. And what we really try to push, especially here in the last four or five years, when we talk about force, 
And then when I first started, it was like a ladder where you looked like you go from rung to rung and they started doing stair steps. What we really try to reinforce now is a critical thinking model. And I know those slides are small and hard to get to, but as you can see, it's circles on the top and you have to constantly evaluate, assess, reevaluate the situation. You know, when you deal with people, especially if they're in crisis or under the influence, or usually a combination of both, their emotions are a roller coaster. They can go up, down, up, down. So you can't get there and treat, treat the whole course of action based on that first event. Every, every second you're dealing with, it, you have to kind of figure out what you have, what's the best course of action, what am I lawfully entitled to do, and what do I need to do next? And that could change in two minutes. You know, they go up, we have to count that, we need to be able to come back down and bring them back down. So I know it's hard to see, and I'll be happy to talk to any of y'all another time or invite you to do some force training if you'd like to sit in on it and see the actual slides and the case that go with this. Um, I kind of geek out on it sometimes because I've been doing it so long, and it's very, very important that we know why we're doing it and we're legally justified to do what we're doing. Most people don't think of force as a seizure under the Constitution, but is there a greater seizure than seizing somebody? So, you know, that's one thing that some of our newer deputies didn't get. Like, you know, they think search and seizures, I'm going to search for drugs or I'm searching for this. They don't get that this is a constitutional seizure. You know, the other ones, 14th and the Eighth Amendment due process and criminal punishment, those apply. So a lot of people don't think of the constitutional ramifications of force. I won't delve down that rabbit hole because, like I said, I could talk to you for about another five hours on use of force. I don't think y'all want that. But you're, I'm happy anytime we do a use of force training. If anybody wants to come, any of the board members want to come sit out on part of it, definitely mm -hmm. love to have you. Mm -hmm. um, go back to my slides here since I got off topic a little bit. Our training topics, you know, de escalation is the buzzword now, but really that is nothing new. You know, we've always tried to get there and de-escalate. Some people are better at it than others, obviously, because we all have different histories, backgrounds, and quite honestly, tolerances. I've seen a lot more people now be self-aware of, you know what, this guy's just getting under my skin. Hey, other deputy, can you deal with him? I'm just going to kind of step back because for whatever reasons, you know, your personalities are clashing. Mm -hmm. I've seen some deputies get there and somebody just gets mad because two years ago, this deputy arrested his brother. You know, so maybe that's not the one that needs to deal with them. That's step back and let somebody else deal with that person to try to not have to go, you know, in a bad direction. Uh, Hands-on techniques, OC, taser, those are just some, you know, different tools we have. You know, if you see the patrol guys, the little bat belts and vests and everything, those are all options. You know, the more options you have besides this, the better it is to take care of a situation. One thing I talked about the General Assembly about training is, you know, when you have to train with something twice a year, that becomes your go-to, you think problem, gun, problem, gun. You know, I suggest that we need to increase our use of force training with the hands-on and the options so you don't automatically equate trouble with gun. Because there's no state mandate on use of force training after the basic academy. I mean, I graduated the basic academy in 1997. And by state law, I don't ever have to practice use of force again. And to me, that's not acceptable. I mean, we don't do that here, but that's just certainly how far off in the training standards are. Any questions on that? I know that was kind of and great. Last one, Moffat, last one. Dynamic fire, what is that? Firearms, I mean, you oh, should. Oh, I said dynamic firearms? Yes. I'm sorry, the state standard is what we call static, which means you stand there and you shoot a piece of paper. Okay. That's what the standard is. It's a 50 round claw course. We shoot a little paper target, they call it a Q target, because it's got a Q on it. Basically, it looks like a bowling pin. That's not realistic training. You know, because you're standing there, you're waiting for a whistle to blow, you boom, boom, two rounds, boom, boom. That's not how things work in the real world. So when I say dynamic training, like we're talking about like moving, shooting, cover, you know, shoot, don't shoot scenarios, um, low light, incorporating rescue drills into that. The one slide earlier with the tourniquet, that was actually done in a fire. That's during our firearms training that we're practicing tourniquets. So, you know, we realize if we do have to harm somebody, we want to treat them as well. So we actually, that was probably about two years ago where we integrated the firearms and first aid into the together because we need to be able to take care of the person. God forbid we have to shoot them. We want to try to, to minimize that damage as much as possible. So it's just more than the state mandated static course. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> this is some of our specialized trainings. Uh, I just put a couple of logos out there. I covered some of this already. Um, CIT, that's the crisis intervention training. We already talked about that. That's a 40 hour course. 
child abuse training. Uh, we have some detectives that have been to used to be called finding words and they changed the name. I believe it's child first training now about forensic interviews because it's very specialized ways you know, when you deal with children, you have to talk to them. Uh, domestic violence training, like I said, we have a great relationship with the shelter path and emergency to train on trying to break that domestic cycle. Um, I'll be happy to tell you about lack assessments at some point if they want to hear. It's a lethality assessment we do at the scene of domestic violence to try to get that person contact to a shelter right then and there that night. So they can try to get some help to help break that cycle. It's such a difficult cycle. Uh, we do a special DUI testing enforcement, computer crimes. Uh, I would hazard to guess we probably have one of the best computer crimes capabilities for an agency this size, probably in the state. Uh, we've been able to find a lot of good and free resources through the federal government partnerships. Uh, assuming my, my lieutenant too, he's actually in Florida right now getting a certification. We're part of ICAC, which is Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, who works on uh, child pornography and things of that nature. So we have a pretty robust system, a lot of it thanks to the super service and federal pack, federal dollars. You know, I've got a $16,000 computer sitting there that's looking really cool that we don't own it, but it's, but it's on loan from, from the feds. But we just use it. And all that helps the citizens of this county because we don't try to bring people in here, but we try to take care of the situations we have. <laughs> death scene investigations. Most people don't realize that any non-clinical death law enforcement has to investigate. So even if, you know, somebody comes to a house and finds, you know, their grandmother somebody passed away, we have to investigate that to make sure there's no foul play involved. Same with suicides. A lot of people don't realize how many death calls you probably didn't share this in the rescue squad <coughs> in this county. General home. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very frequent. You know, we sent one of our detectives to arson investigation school. So we have a certified arson investigator on staff. We used to rely on state police for a lot of these specialized resources, but just because of their staffing levels and their mandates and limited things, we've learned that we need to be able to do it in-house more because sometimes it takes them four, five, six, seven hours to respond to things. So we started doing it ourselves and specialized leadership training. The past three or four years, we really focused on getting our leadership because leadership's from the top down. So we really focused on getting our leadership in a mindset of taking care of our citizens so we can push that model down to our to our staff. Any questions on here? Next slide. On the job training, um, that's just a picture from some traffic stop training. I can't tell if that's one of our guys or one of our reserve guys. But, you know, every call is different. You know, in law enforcement, everything is what I call situationally specific because one or two facts change that can change the outcome of the case. Uh, so we review every call that we can. You know, we have a very robust documenting system. The county spent a lot of money several years back to get us a new one um, to meet some of the reporting requirements. And I'll cover what the future reporting requirements are. You know, I read every report. The sheriff reads all reports. My captain reads every report. So that's one way we do quality, basically a quality control check. You know, we go up and see what's going on. Body cameras, all our patrol deputies have body cameras. We are in the process of getting, we were awarded the grant to get every deputy a body camera. And those are the little squares you see the deputy wearing on the chest. All our patrol cars have in-car cameras. So on our patrol unit, uh, they have four cameras typically going at every scene, which is a whole lot of bad to manage, but that's not the point of this lecture, but it gives us a chance to go back and monitor things. And if they have complaints, if they have any issues, we can go back firsthand and see that. When I started, you know, doing this years ago, I worked internal affairs stuff for a while. You basically had to go off of statements. You didn't know for sure. And a lot of complaints would be unsubstantiated or not able to determine. You know, this person, the, the citizen saying one thing, the, the officer saying something else, and there's no other witnesses. So you can't tell what happened. With body cameras, it's, I can tell what happened. And most complaints we've had, the body camera has absolved the deputy. I've invited probably about six people to come down and watch a body camera with us make a complaint. So far, I've had zero people come and actually watch that. And, you know, some of the complaints are pretty egregious. Uh, I won't get into all those either, but they're wonderful. We talked about case law earlier, how that changes all the time. And we have to stay on top of it. We talked about our web-based training. Like I said, it's not as you lose some on internet training. You've been in enough Zoom meetings, you know, you lose some of that contact. But it's better than nothing, and it helps us kind of maintain and get through when we can't afford or don't have the staffing levels to send somebody to Weir's Cave or to Lynchburg for training. Mm -hmm. When we do our shifts, we try to place the newer deputies with senior deputies and mentorship so they can work together and kind of one learn from the other. 
because, you know, you get old, crusty guys like me. Sometimes we can learn stuff from the younger people. They might not know all the legal parts of it. I'm not going to know all the new lingo or half the stuff that are on this phone. Somebody's telling me about an app, you know, so I got to find a younger person to help teach me. <laughs> so we try to balance our shifts out because, like I said, there's different personality types. I don't want six people like writing tickets on one shift. I need the one person who's really good at talking to people in crisis, maybe the one person that's really good on case law. So that way they can work together as a cohesive team. Next slide. I'm probably going over 10 minutes, so I apologize. These are some of the challenges you know, we're facing. A lot of people base their knowledge of law enforcement off of what they see on TV, you know, law and order, CSI. Obviously, I'm not as good looking as the people you see on TV. So clearly, that's not how it works. No, not. We, you know, most people, you know, it's a very, like I said, it's a very broad profession. People don't realize how much we do. And there was, I can't remember the name of the author wrote an article. And that's one reason law enforcement fails sometimes because people expect so much from us. It's hard for one person to do all that, especially somebody that's working 12 hour rotating shifts and making about 40 grand a year. But for that 40 grand, you know, they expect us to have master's degree level so psychology and human behavior. You know, they want Navy SEAL level marksmen and fighters who can shoot a bird off at a thousand yards and, you know, one click and just take somebody down. Uh, they expect us to be lawyers, forensic scientists, computer science. Social workers, you know, they expect somebody who can drive like they're in NASCAR. And basically, I think some people think we can see the future. Um, I wish I could make my job a lot easier. I thought buy some lottery tickets tonight, but we can't. And, you know, they want all this level of training, they, such a high level of training, but we have to do it while maintaining 24 hours a day, seven days a week coverage. And we can't run up our overtime costs to do that. We can't close down to send, I can't send a shift to training and close that shift. I can't say you reach 911. We're in training today. Please call back tomorrow. So it's very hard for us to get cohesive training because I can't pull everybody off to send them to the academy for a week. So we have to do it by piecemeal. So you only have an, we have a finite number of staff, and to try to send somebody away, that means somebody's got to fill that slot. So that's either going to be overtime or we just do without. And we send them on their off days, and you have to worry about deputy burnout because you work in six, 12 hour shifts in a row. How efficient is that person going to be? A lot of bad things happen when, when the deputies aren't mentally fit, when they're tired. You know, you want a healthy, you want a mentally focused deputy. And if you make them work too much to go to training, you're not getting that. And that's where things can fall through the cracks. You know, if you look at the military model, how much time does military spend training versus they spend in combat? They train probably five times more than they ever fight. You know, to train to the level that I think most people expect us to be, you don't need to double or triple the size of every law enforcement agency in the county. So you could have one team working and then one team in training and then swap them out all the time and go back and forth. But that's not cost effective. So we do the best we can with what we have. Next slide. I talked about some of this already. This is how we try to respond to those challenges I mentioned. We talked about team concepts. You know, we try to put the diverse skill sets together on a shift. You know, we try to focus on the deputy strength and try to improve the weaknesses. You know, we are all good at things. We're all bad at things. So we try to, self-awareness is a big issue with us, try to make sure we understand that and try to kind of marry people together. We, we often refer to some people on the shift called, you know, their, their shift wife, their shift husband, or their shift partner, because they spend more time probably with that person than they probably do spend with their own spouse. Um, you know, it's a 12-hour shift and get long. The sheriff, and I'm sure y'all know this, is very big on community engagement, you know, and empathy. I actually have a sign on the exit door going out that says empathy on it to try to, you know, these little subtle hints to try to remind people that when we deal with people, we're dealing with them probably on a not a good day for them. Nobody calls law enforcement because everything's great. You know, when they encounter us, they're probably not at their best self. So we have to be aware of that and kind of adapt for that and be empathetic to the situation talked about constant self-examination. We talked about our training reviews and updates. We talked about the legal updates and the new policy review. You know, we re review our policies all the time. When these standards change, when something changes, we look at the policy and all the way up to the industry standard, all the way up to what our community expects. Um, you know, does it protect us lively or and is it the right thing to do? Those are all things we look at when we look at policies. I get a lot of our policies from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, I'm a member of them. I've been for about five years. And they have a, a policy website where I can go and I'm not going to lie, steal them from them, but they allow you to steal them from them. So it's not bad. But it's a good resource because that way it's a 
nationwide vetted policy. Yes, about use of force. Ooh, for last year, or it might have been in 2019, we changed our use of force policy based on the ISCP policy, the National Association of Chiefs of Police policy. They, there's a whole white paper and a consensus practices that a best practices guide uh, that we actually changed our to ahead of the General Assembly changing it for us, essentially. And what we had put in our policy, I'd have to change but like two words in it when the General Assembly changed the use of force guidelines because we'd already had that in our policy. We're already doing it that way. And that does talk about things like neck restraints and other things. So we we try to stay as current as we can to, to kind of get ahead of that curve. And we talked about deputy wellness. You know, if you don't have a well mentally sound deputy, bad things can happen. Next slide. And these are some of the trends and the sheriff will get into some more of this. And that famous last word on the top thing, unfunded mandates. <laughs> Mr. Weaver's favorite word, I believe. Uh, trends, laws, and changes. We all know the past several years, there's been a lot of changes at the General Assembly level and the federal level. You know, we, we've been working to meet those changes as they come about uh, without getting into so much editorial comment. I think some are better planned than others. Like the sheriff said, we're still waiting to see some of the changes that we're supposed to know about taking effect in July, we don't really know what we're supposed to do yet. So we have to be fairly flowing. You know, last year, and I forget the name of the program, I didn't write it down. We got certified through DCJS and the accreditation board to meet the federal guidelines so we can receive grant funding. And to do that, we had to have certain things in our policies. There was a community policing act that got passed on the federal level. And if we didn't comply, we could get federal grant dollars. So we modified some of our policies. Most of it was use of force, culture diversity, and implicit bias stuff. That we had to have the training on to get that. So if you look on our webpage, it actually has that document on there. I should have put it here, but it just slipped my mind. There's going to be an increase in unfunded state mandates that will have significant impacts. Um, there's a lot of training. I think the sheriff's got the list in front of them there. That's going to come down the road. And we talked about training, sometimes can equal dollars. There's going to be a whole lot of data requirements. That was one reason we wanted that additional uh, civilian position to help us with those new data management training. I don't know if anybody's been to our website. But we post on their monthly statistics for the agency. Uh, you know, one of those being last year, the state police did a mandatory traffic stop data reporting form. So that is on our website. Uh, and actually, we started putting it on our website before the state again told us we have to. We actually were doing that before the state told us to do it. We don't know what they're going to be. So we're going to have to adapt to those and wait and see. Um, the sheriff will get into that. You know, the Marcus Alerts, another thing, it's a mental health alert system they're talking about doing with these joint teams which would be good. I don't know where the money's gonna come from because I don't know if he's gonna even talk about the cost involved. There's gonna well, be a lot the, of costs. Marcus alert is, I think we have till 2026 to get that up, up and running, but agencies are trying to, to assess what it's gonna cost. And Sheriff Carter out of Shenandoah County uh, did an assessment for, for their county and it would cost the county upwards of a million dollars. It's basically what you have to have. And not only you have to have law enforcement out there, you have to have people in civilian clothes in an unmarked car to be able to respond to certain calls for service. So, but the good side of that is if we could team and partner with other agencies as well as other jurisdictions, maybe to cut down on the cost for everybody around us. So it's it's uh, a lot of studying to be done on that. Uh, but it's uh, it's something that we're you know we're going to have to address. And we'll we'll be talking about that at our sheriff's conference in in June, uh, starting some of those conversations. What is it? What is Marcus Alerts? Uh, I'm sorry, it's it's a uh, I forgot the acronym it stands for. But there's a gentleman I forget his last name. His first name is Marcus, who was shot by Richmond Police, I believe, four or five years ago. He was having a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Ended up driving the wrong way down the interstate. I believe he was naked. Got mm -hmm. through an altercation. Yeah. And they made an acronym for this, but it's basically a, a, a team of mental health professionals. The, the goal is a team of mental health professionals and law enforcement with mental health being the primary lead of it. It's been tasked with the Department of Behavioral Sciences to kind of come up with how to do this. I think it worked well in an urban model. We had the population instinct. I'm skeptical in the rural model because while well, we have those calls, I, I don't know how you can staff them at full time for a call that happens once or twice a week. Um, so it's a, it's a way to better respond to mental health calls. Because we, we're responsible, I know most people realize, we do all mental health transports, emergency custody transports, and temporary detention transports. You know, and they're off into Virginia Beach to Southwest Virginia. So that's, again, time we have to have two deputies off the road, drive six hours down one way and six hours back. 
to transport a mental health person. And it's not good for a mental health person in a crisis to get put in the back of a police car and driven for six hours. So but that's trying, when you that's when you can't find a place locally, because then UVA take you. No, 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 no. No, um, we don't do that again. That's all done through regions and other places. We just mm -hmm. are in a taxi service essentially. We initially take them to UVA for assessment. Okay. But I have not seen five East host a prisoner, or not a prisoner, sorry, uh, person in crisis. I'm just thinking outside. So, uh, many, many, many times because they have a very small number of beds. Yeah. I don't know if y'all been around. I know you paying attention, but was, I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago, the state drastically reduced funding for mental health services in a lot of state hospitals, got reduced or shut down. Mm -hmm. That had a tremendous adverse impact on us because in right what they're doing now, there's so few beds. And so, especially with COVID and everything else, mental health stuff and tracking it is going way up through the roof as far as people in need. And there's certainly no bed space for them. So we'll do the detention order. Then we end up waiting for eight hours, and by eight hours, then they'll do the right us one, but they say, hold up on the transport, we're still fighting the bed. And our options are either they're taking the first spot and we can almost get there, which has happened, and then we have to turn them around and go somewhere else. It's it's a terrible system. And, and take them back to, to that other spot. And I say, I mean, literally we've gone like Lebanon and Abington to take people there. I think the last one is to Virginia Beach. So you're literally driving all over the state with a person in crisis in the back of a police car. This is, a, you know, once again, it's one of those things that the state is not adequately funding the mental health facilities. And then you throw COVID into the mix this year. There are many times, especially over the holidays, where they send out messages saying, sorry, we're at capacity. We have and we have no beds. And, and we have we still follow through with the TDOs and ECOs and we take them to UVA. And, and we stay with them and, and, until they decide what they're going to do. And that's part of the, the mandate because we're the law enforcement for the, for the county. So uh, hopefully it's going to get better and hopefully there'll be some more money put them to, into more bed space. So because you have certain facilities that will take certain types of people, younger people go to different places. Uh, the, our biggest facility is close by the Western State. It's one of the largest, but it's always full. And mental health transports are a very challenging thing from a liability and law enforcement perspective. You know, what I talked about earlier, use of force is a Fourth Amendment seizure. So we have to have a lawful purpose to see somebody. Well, being a person in crisis is not a crime, but yet we have paperwork and orders that we have to take into custody because they take you somewhere. So it's very difficult to know which levels of force because unfortunately people in crisis and under substance abuse issues can also be very violent. Uh, and it's a very challenging thing for the deputies when we train on how do you control somebody, but we're kind of seizing them, but you really can't use too much force on them. There's a lot of case law about tasers and pepper sprays and things like that on mental health subjects. And it's it's kind of a recipe for disaster. So we're trying to do the best we can. And that's part of the intent of the Marcus Alert, I believe, is to try to use, you know, counselors to help de-escalate that. Uh, you know, going to a 40 hour class helps us, but it doesn't make us a social worker. It doesn't make us a mental health specialist. So that's, I think that was my last slide, is that correct? Yeah. So that was kind of the short -er version of our training program. <laughs> Sorry. The condensed. Yeah, condensed ish version. Do y'all have any other questions or anything else I can answer for any of y'all? Um, Sheriff, did you have something you want to add? Yes, I have, I have a few things I'd like to cover. Just, just give you a heads up. There's a tremendous amount of information um, that I learned at the last uh, Chiefs of Police conference that I went to. And here, just, and, and if you want to know specifics about any of these, I'll stop and, and discuss it with you. The uh, use of force has been changed in the state. Uh, search warrants significantly changed. Uh, uh, shooting at a motor vehicle, that, that's another one that was changed. Uh, prohibitation of uh, necrosaints, except in, in, uh, in case you're in a, a moral combat situation where uh, you get to the escalation to the point where you can use deadly force, then you can use that chokehold. But to restrain somebody and arrest them, that's, not, that's no longer permitted. Uh, requirements to intervene in excessive force. So if I go to a call, and I think that deputy is using excessive force on somebody. It, it's mandated now that I step in and have something to say about that. Uh, the, uh, let's see. 
Uh, and then it's also uh, mandated that I report that to my supervisors that there was excessive force right. use. And there, there again, it would get reported. And then, then we would watch the body cam footage and it would tell the whole story. Uh, restrictions on military equipment, uh, like last year when we asked y'all, can we replace all our M16s with the, the few that we needed? Uh, we're still waiting on those rifles. Uh, <laughs> they've been on order since what, August? <laughs> uh, kind of like our ammo, it's it's out there somewhere. But uh, okay. of course, everybody's heard about the marijuana changes that went into effect last July already. And now in July, one again, they'll be, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty much wide open. So we're waiting on all this stuff to come back to see how we're going to do it. Uh, lots of limitations on traffic stops. There are things now that we can't stop people for. You used to have a headlight out. We can stop you 99.9% .9 of the time. We would not write you a ticket. Just say you need to get your headlight fixed. But now you can't. You can drive by me all day long with that headlight out. <laughs> Same thing for the, for the taillight. So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of changes. That little red car that was on that one picture, I swear <laughs> I thought that was Miss Booker. <laughs> But but the thing the thing I worry about with that is that was a that was a lead in to a lot of DUI arrests. So we'll we'll see over the over time how, how what kind of an increase that we do have. Hopefully not of of, of uh, uh, DUI related crashes. Uh, let's see. And your vehicle registration. Uh, we used to give everybody a a, a month here. Uh, anyway, uh, but now the law says you give them a month and a day, uh, four months and a day. So, so it just extend, extend that time before we can actually stop you as a primary offense for that. So uh, that being said, all those are, are the things that have been changed. All the training things that we, we talked about, everything there is, 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 is there going to be some kind of changes uh, in some form, but right now, the process they have is taking a lot longer because they, they write it up, they give it to a review board and it gives it to somebody else and then it gets back uh, for rewrites. And as of last month, it hasn't, hasn't been finished yet. So uh, I hope this helps. Anything else you all want in the future, please let us know. Yeah. Uh, we'll be glad to help you out. Any, any other questions on anything about the Sheriff's Office? Yeah, this is Moselle. Um, I know in one of these letters, someone talked about the reserve deputies. There seems to be some, I don't know, misunderstanding about okay. the reserve deputy, how much um, that they are not, they don't receive the de-escalation training. No, they they um, receive all the training all the that training we do. That yes, you do. Okay. Yes, they participate when we're doing it, we invite them. Mm -hmm. And then if, if at some point, they're not able to come when we do, they have their own training too. So they get the exact same training. And a lot of what de what we're calling de-escalation training now, it was, you know, like Major Wells was saying back in the day, it was called the force continuum, you know, or now the situational. You know, you go into a situation, it's crazy. Your first objective is to talk those people down. And then you readjust to where you're going. You continually may have to do that. To, to make a situation a better situation. Mm -hmm. So, but every every body uh, that is a reserve does the same training that we do with us. Right. And another concern that I heard was that you can't tell the difference between the reserve deputy and the deputy because you you dress alike. Yes, ma'am. Two things are is there. It'll say reserve on their name tag. Okay. Everybody everybody wears a name tag, so you mm -hmm. know who they are. And the other thing is their badge. But they usually have a uniform like you yes, have. And you'll they'll <coughs> always be with another full-time deputy. Mm -hmm. They never work independently on their own. And do they have a weapon? Yes, ma'am. They go through the same 40 hours of training, just like they would go to the law enforcement academy. And you have to shoot X number of rounds. You have to qualify different things. You have to have a lot of use of force training, all that they go through the exact same things uh, that we do. And then they go out and, and do the in-service training that we do and the qualifying that we do, exactly like what we do. But they can't do anything unless a they certified always, person is with them. They always work, If say if they're helping us out in the courtroom, which we have two that work in the courtroom quite often, and they're actually retired 20 year plus law enforcement for folks, but there's always uh, six, seven people in the courtroom. Same thing, 
Uh, um, most of the time, if they come and ride around with the officer, they ride around in the car. They they don't ever drive the car. They don't they they don't do any of that stuff. And they're basically <laughs> the second person, the safety officer. And uh, and we do issue them a body camera when they do go out in the car. Okay, yeah, because that was the question right. too yes, that they didn't have a body no, camera. We don't. We don't. It, we, it once, we, once we get the new cameras that come in, then everybody's going to have a body camera even the investigators, everybody that goes out will have one of those. So right now it's kind of like uh, just a patrol division has them and, and with the, allowing us to do the grant and, and I'm paying the match money on that. And we did it with a, a, a lot of equipment this year that we wanted, but I thought those body cameras were more important. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how long do they work? I mean, do they, are they out every night or do they have a certain amount They're of time? Retired to do eight hours and it's eight hours of volunteer community service work a month. Some do significantly more, uh, but you have to do a minimum of, of eight hours. And they go through uh, 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 the training that we put them through. The Major Wells talked about that there, it doesn't describe it as deputies, but as police officers auxiliary, we do the same thing. And that's, a, that's about 180 hours of, of classroom, initially in classrooms. Mm -hmm. I think there's perhaps a misunderstanding of the reserve than actually there is. It's just a volunteer support unit. I would say the average annual reserve. Get to the mic. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a support unit. You're not going to call 911 and have a reserve deputy just show up at your house. You know, chances are nine times out of 10, you're not going to have a reserve deputy there at all. You know, if they're riding with somebody, they're going to be there solely in a support function for, for the full time sworn certified staff. You know, they help us a lot with major events, traffic control, things like that. You know, if we're at a crash, uh, they help with that. You know, their, their main function is to be a second set of eyes and ears for us. Very, very rarely they ever even go hands on with anybody unless the situation is very much devolved. They're kind of like when I talk about field training when that new officer is kind of standing in the background observing. That's what they do probably 99% of the time if they're not at a traffic post. Now, we put them on a traffic post with the, with the full time officer. To help with traffic and things of that nature because it saves us a lot of staffing. But you're like I said, you're never gonna not call 911 have a reserve to show up. The average age of our reserve unit is probably about 50 to 55. Uh, most of the we have a lot of retired military law enforcement people, uh, small business owners, other county involved persons and volunteers, a commissioner of revenue, you know, is one of our reserves. Um, so women. We have two currently, I believe. Um, you know, we, we try to recruit everybody, same for our full-time staff. You know, we want to be represented by our county. Now, of the reserves that you've had in the past, haven't you had quite a few of them go on to become full-time officers? We've probably hired about five of them. Some of our reserves are actually certified law enforcement officers are retired or they search professions. They still want to be in it. One of our females, you know, was a show for face officer. Quite a while they can switch to the profession, but she still wanted to kind of do something, especially with you know, some other obligations in a way. So she's actually a certified, you know, law enforcement officer. Uh, you know, when your family members there used to work for us and wanted to start work his own business, but he saw a reserve unit as a certified officer. So, you know, but at, at the same time, some of them don't make it. Yeah. If you, it's no different than a full time deputy. If you can't talk to people, you can't treat people right, mm -hmm. this is probably not the job for you. And we've done that. And when I mentioned field training, they have that same field training monitor. So we have records of their training. And like I said, they're not a primary response group. They're a secondary support group. They're not I even see trained them every, on I see several of them every morning because thank y'all, first off, for being at schools. I don't know if y'all drive by the schools mm -hmm. in the morning time, but on a school bus, you know, they have officers that are sitting there just about every time the kids are getting the buses are coming in or out. And it's central. Since we've gone back to having the additional kids, thank God they have at least two officers, sometimes three officers. I'm guessing a right. couple it, of them are the reserve. And like, oh, those, those are, most are, of them are paid. They're all they're all uh, our regular deputies because they're driving around in a car. I, I'm telling and, you because uh, it is and uh, it works as long as we don't have a, a call. As for long service. as you don't have a call, go. right? Exactly. But you take a day like yesterday. Okay, I, I'm walking out the door to get ready to walk home, and then this storm blows in. 
So the <laughs> office, everybody empties the office. They get in their car, they go out to answer calls and help people. I turned around, went back into dispatch. One of the investigators came in. We were answering calls, helping the dispatchers that were in there. And then everybody else was out trying to coordinate what was going on. And, and that's a team effort. And then fire rescue gets involved. And let me tell you, with yesterday, I was very proud of everybody. Everybody did an amazing job. They cleaned those streets up. And I mean, private citizens of Miss Lindenhurst, uh, one of her sons unloaded his skid steer and cleared the road so everybody could get through. Well, I was riding tree. with a, one of my students and we pulled out, we pulled out of EWs and went about a hundred yards down to the creek. Uh, and the next thing you know, we couldn't see until we got to the middle school. Uh -huh. And so it was then we left and went down uh, Central Plains uh -huh. when it started to clear a little bit. And I told them, I called up dispatch. I said, this is why I love Blue Valley County. There were private citizens cutting trees yeah. out of the road on Central Plains. And I said, they're probably going to have it cleared pretty soon. Exactly. That might have been where he was. Hey, country people know how to take care of that. Uh, you know, you do what you got to do. Um <laughs> Exactly. No, we have a great community. And, and when things like that, or people are in need of food, you know, we had a food drive with the rotary, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how giving people are. Now, the one thing that you talked about that caught my attention had nothing to do with y'all was the, and then I think it caught George Miss Booker was the low requirements by the state. The minimum oh, requirements oh, are, absolutely. I mean, that they're ridiculously low. They right. But but I said it's so glad I am so glad to see that y'all are expanding those and building on top of that right. to make sure that we're doing the best we can to take care of they really need all to go, citizens. They need to go back to some of the, the Obama era, the 21st century policing. He did it right. He went around the country, got sheriffs, police chiefs all together, and sat them down and said, What do we need to do to do this right? And they wrote it out but not everybody followed it. Yeah. You know, like, like we talked about earlier, you know, your agency has to represent your community, you know, and you have, you have to be a part of that community. You can't just go out and, and do a job. And that's a, that's the sell in that we do to try to get people that live here is guess what? If you live here, you raise your family here, you know, when you're working, there's no reason you can't go by that school and have lunch with your kid, mm -hmm. watch them play ball or whatever, because you got your walk in your hand. You can leave in a, in a split second to go answer a call for service. Yeah, I have, more, I have lots of deputies and state troopers living in Fox Union. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we talked about the different counties, yeah. people. Uh, we had a motorcycle accident. <laughs> no, this was literally... I was driving. It was this weekend. It was Sunday afternoon because I had, I was I was going to take pizza to my wife up there at work when they all got off, and I come driving by and Chief Pullen's wife was standing in front of the building waving her arms, and there was a motorcycle accident a quarter of a mile away from the firehouse just down the hill, and as I rolled down there, there's a police there's a dead officer sitting there dead. I was like, okay, great, man, flew down got well, it wasn't a Blue Banner deputy. It was an Albemarle deputy who lives right there on Hillsborough Lane right, right. that literally pulled up and was helping this young man until the Blue Banner deputy arrived and he stayed and helped the Blue Banner deputy. So to me, we're all in this together. Exactly. So our ju the jurisdictions around us, we work seamlessly with them. But I know we're way, way over mm -hmm. our time. Any mm -hmm. other specific questions you would like? or And, and all of y'all have my phone number. All you have to do is call. And, and ask and and please we're we're, we're going to invite y'all you come to some of our training you'll be surprised and and at the jail they've just uh, purchased a new uh simulator and at some point when we get all all this uh vast stuff done and all uh if you want to go down and see what it's like to be in a in a real scenario where you shoot or don't shoot and things like that We'll be glad to kind of like some there. of the things we've yes, seen on about. TV when Dirty Harry or somebody's walking yeah. through. The, I mean, yeah. I didn't say it that way where you have the different yeah. things pop up. It's, it's expensive, but it's the most yeah. realistic yeah. training you'll go through. Oh, yeah. electronic? Yeah, absolutely. It's all right. Every, everything. It's, am it's amazing. It's amazing. But anyway, thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. All righty. Uh, next up is the consent agenda. G, minutes of April 21st, 2021, Ms. Elise H. Resolution recognizing Matthew Covington Gresham, Eagle Scout, Ms. Solis. 
I'm glad we read that one because I got to give that, that out this weekend. Um, I, FY21, DEQ, Zions Crossroads, West Waterline Supplemental Appropriation, Ms. McGyver. J, ZXR Construction Services, PA number eight, Ms. Toller. K, AG Dillard, change order number six, Ms. Toller. And L, Adams Creek Agricultural Rest Forestal District Review and Renewal, Mr. Overtree. Is there anything we need to pull? The Eagles got one. Do you, um, we don't. His mom yeah. teaches with me. Yeah, are you going, do they have an open ceremony now with the culprit or? It's at one of the churches. I can't remember which one, yeah. but they are having a ceremony. I believe it's at Lake Christian. Yeah, that's a huge difference. Yes, ma'am. It's true. either Lake Christian or the yeah. Catholic Church. Right, because one time Bible. we had a whole lot of Eagle Scouts. We, we did. And uh -huh. I do. Uh -huh. We usually. Uh, all right. I will try to say. Yeah. I will try to send something to you. But uh, the only reason I did this and I brought it to Kelly's attention, I teach with the mom. Mm -hmm. The mom was like, "Oh, we want you to be there." And he's a ninth grader, so he's done it really wow. fast. Wow. Yeah, he's a really good young man. He helped uh, when he. I, I did a lot better in our fantasy NASCAR when he was at the middle school because. <laughs> He pays very close attention to that stuff, and I don't. So now they just laugh at me. <laughs> All righty. So, um, anything else need to be pulled? Do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I move we approve the consent agenda G through L. Do I have a second? Second. Got a motion made by Mr. Weaver and seconded by Ms. Eager. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. We now accepted the consent agenda and now move forward with unfinished business. M redistricting 2021 update, Mr. Dahl. There's Ms. Harris is just going to give a really, really quick update. Yeah. The really, really quick update is that there is basically no update. Um, <laughs> the census made a really big deal. I think I can't remember if it was last week or the week before. Um, what they did release were total population um, data for every state for apportionment purposes for. Um, Senate seats, and that's it. We didn't get any county data at all. Okay, so we're still sitting and waiting. It, it says here the county must redistrict in 2021. Yes. All righty. Well, I guess we're going to continue uh, to sit and wait. Um, yeah. where, are, where are we? What, oh. what Miss Booker? I sent you a text message. You didn't uh, read my message. No, ma'am, because I also got a text message from Coach Carter, who was using my bus to take the uh, middle school baseball team and I'm right. telling him I'm in a board yeah. meeting. Yeah. I can't talk right now. Right. I will check yours next. Yeah, I had, I wanted to just um, thank, you know, the community. And tonight when they made some comments, you know, last at our last meeting, when we talked about changing the words to our resolution. Now, I had the resolution in my hand and did not uh, really um, recognize the fact that we were talking about not only George Ford, we were also talking about Rashad Brooks. Now, when we talked about changing the word, we were basing it on the fact that um, uh, the one in Minnesota had been uh, in the trial and he had been convicted, but Rashad Brooks has not come to trial at all. So I don't. So I'm we thinking, hold off on both. Yeah, I'm thinking. Well, I don't know what you to do. I don't think it needs to be. I mean, it could stay tabled. Um, we could just leave it at at death because we based our decision on um, the trial would be over and that person would be prosecuted. That's why we said that uh, Mr. Shevin had gone through the and he they had declared that he had murdered uh, George Ford, but Richard Brooks, we don't, that has never been done. And the other thing that I think that I was concerned about too was and, and that was mentioned in some of the letters is that we based our decision on table it because of what Fred had said. And um, I thought about uh, what Fred said and 
I thought that at the time I was, you know, I was over here just grumbling, Fred, at you, but I guess I must have had my mic off. I'm just saying, I, I, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. So I thought that, Fred, that you um, based some, uh, I thought you were giving your opinion. I didn't hear any legal thing that you were trying to give to us in order for us to make that decision. And to me and a couple of the people in the community in these letters said that the same thing, they thought it was an inappropriate uh, response. Um, that you pretty much critiqued what the jury had done, and then um, you what the uh, um, what the judge could do, and also the part about we have to be careful as elected officials because we don't want to influence juries. And I think Samilly may have said very well that I don't think anybody would have paid any attention to little old, what old little old Fluvian County said. So we're at the point now. I don't know, putting this on the table, I mean, I just don't think, I think we ought to just vote on it and leave it the way it is for just, right now. Just leave it the way it is for right now. That's yeah. Yeah, we don't yeah. need to vote for that. We just leave it alone. Yeah, right. And and it's not, we need to be more concerned about these other paragraphs and we've had to sheriff and major in here because a lot of this was centered around the sheriff and major. And they've come and they've made a report to us. Um, but there are other things in this resolution that we should be looking at. I think that maybe this isn't something that we need to do. Hopefully the community can put together some trainings um, like the school system is going through. I think y'all will be going through more anti-bias, anti-racism uh, training and things. And um, all of us need to be versed in that. We all, we, we need, if, so hopefully if we get some training to come to the community, UVA can do it, um, that we will be present there. And we need to just broaden our knowledge of the diversity and we need to be able to use our equity lens at everything that we do. Um, that's the value of this resolution. And that's what we went through in 2020 during this time when the world was protesting against and that we still have things going on in the United States of America between shootings and young people and people dying. So um, I just like to bring some closure to it and but to move forward and see what other kind of things that we need to be doing to bring our community together more. And I'm sure that um, Sheriff Hess and Major Wells will come back to us periodically and they have a website that we can go, but everybody can't go on the website. Come back to us and keep us informed on what kinds of things is going on um, in the county. So I um, just wanted Fred to know, you know, how I felt about that. And I may be wrong as, as I can it's, be. It's just like the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. There are hot button topics that get you passionate. That's Coach, that's Mr. Uh, O'Brien's word, get passionate about stuff. And, you know, it's uh, our job is to stay as level as we can to make sure that we're as respectful and set as good example as we can to the community. But we've heard so many times tonight talking about how this community comes together at different times to work together. And, and I mean, it, uh, you know, I just wish our country would get back to two words right and wrong and 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 focus on right and wrong and, and common sense you know they were talking about all the different titles for everything that they were doing use common sense treat people as the way you want to be treated Mr. chairman i don't want to, i don't want to uh oh i got this, to but, i know but, again uh, since i have been accused of doing things that were inappropriate or unprofessional uh I just want to point out one one thing. I told you that I did not consider this verdict to be final. That's not, that's not a matter of opinion. 
this verdict is not final until it's embodied in, in the judgment of the court and the court has not ruled on it. Secondly, if the judgment, if the judgment is entered, it is subject to being modified later on. And one thing has happened recently that I don't know whether you all know this, but there has been a motion for, for a new trial that's set for it to be heard before the before the uh, uh, the order would be entered. And there and one of the bases for that new trial is juror misconduct. And I don't I'm not commenting on whether whether the juror misconduct happened. I'm just not I, all I heard is a news report on it. And whether the court would find that to be sufficient to, for, to grant a new trial, I don't know. But it's a that's that's a pending issue. And so I I say to you again, you should not consider this matter to be ended. Well, and Ms. Booker made a very valid point. One case may have ended, ended but the other case has not ended. So right. The, it, it, it just yes. Well, I, I think that the we learned, uh, not learned, but we were reminded last week um, that the community does have a lot of passion, does care a lot about uh, how we're approaching this and 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 statements that we made, uh, and and you know I'm I, I'm glad that we had this presentation on the from the sheriff and and I think I commend them they're doing an excellent job. Uh, I'm glad that schools are doing uh, some of the training themselves as well too, and and I think the board and, and or the county administrative staff should look at you know just some bias training some you know sexism racism trade training as well too. I certainly would be willing to participate in it because I'm not always aware when I'm making a statement that may may sound you know inappropriate you know or may or, or may be callous to the experiences that somebody else has had and uh, you know uh, I, I don't think for example Mr. Weaver ever intended to be callous in his statements and his remarks but sometimes that may come out in such a way that it can be viewed that way and since we are public officials and we are presenting ourselves and we are the leaders in the community, making sure that we, we are aware of our own faults uh, to me makes a lot of sense. So I, I would certainly encourage the, the board to consider, you know, uh, funding some training for the, the county administration staff and for us as well too. I agree. I'm glad you addressed that yes. point because you and I have only been here for eight years or seven and a half years, however long it's been. Miss Mr. Weaver and Ms. Booker have been here a long time and they have never done anything except treat each other with respect. And you can tell that they're as genuine to each other as they can be. Always have been in this. But anyway. And, and it's, a, you know, it's, it's from the outside sometimes that you don't see well, that you, you think of the board a certain way, you know, and that's just. The and I'm sorry, we're not telling you who we are. This, Mr. O'Brien and I are just going back and forth, but Major Wells made a great point. Sometimes when you go to Zoom and stuff of that nature, you can't tell exactly what's going on in the room. You just have to hear part of it and then make a decision on your own. And that makes it very tough. So I apologize for not stating who yeah. I was. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Weaver and I have had a nice conversation and we found out different things about each other. We, we, I taught him some things. He taught me some yeah. on the phone, about an hour and so. So, <laughs> so, some, so sometimes things happen that will bring us together for a purpose. And um, that's so, the one thing we've talked about is the diversity on this board that we all come from different backgrounds. I mean, heck, one of us born in Spain. Uh, Mexico. <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> I lived in Spain. I had it backwards. But, but anyway, I mean, you know, it, it's it's very diverse and we're a group that has mutual respect for one another. Although we all don't always agree on certain everything because God knows budget time comes around. Not very often if we all agreed on that. But uh, all right, let's get this over with so we can get on to our closed session. Um I will now open the second round of public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board, please state your name, address. Please keep your comments to five minutes on topic and directed to the board. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Mr. Chair, oh. could I, after you do that, can I do new business? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we didn't do new business. I took that as new business. I apologize. Okay. I will go back. I'm for as far as public comment, I'm going to retrieve that, folks. We'll do that in just a second. It, new business, Ms. Eager. Uh, 
Yes, I have this email from uh, uh, the man who lives in Lake Monticello, but he's in my district. And so he lives on the outside of, you know, like over here on South Boston. And he's complaining about the, the loud noise that trucks make going down the hill. Uh, I think when the Jake break. Jake, Jake break. break. Jake break. Okay, I was, didn't know if it was Jack yeah. or Jake. And fire trucks have it. Yeah. And anyway, uh, he did this recording to uh, let you know how loud it can be. The cars are loud enough. <laughs> uh, I told you one time before I went, used to go spend the night at my aunt's house in Richmond, and they lived right beside 64. And I think I slept like 10 minutes the whole night because every time a car or truck went by, I thought they were running over me. Yeah. Talk you and talk you chair cat that complaint with the Drake breaks too. I mean, what, yeah. what round is that? Uh, 600. There it comes. You, you can tell the Jake break, and that, that was a loaded dump truck. Yeah. You let off the gas and it starts to slow itself down rather than picking up speed. Start banging from that so does that happen naturally or just naturally? Tired, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. That's part of the that's part of the system where they use them to keep them under control. So if I rode by there in my in the fire truck without hitting the siren, if I let off the gas, as soon as you let off the gas, you'll okay. So it's, if you that's the about brakes. the best Jake brake impersonation I can get. Not even touching the brakes. Just it's not you're not touching the brakes just letting off gas it's designed to slow itself down we, we hear them in front of the county administration building coming down oh yeah scene all the time all and, the, and you probably hear just about like that as soon as they come by the bank they start down that when it's yeah. 40 and you can come over we know that some of us on here for some of our officers will sit out there uh -huh. they're going down to charlie kids in, in those kind of trucks uh -huh. yes sir 620s yeah. you know if you're going to have logging trucks go by but, and, uh, but uh, is it illegal? No, ma'am. So it's a safety. It's a safety aspect. So what? What can we do Nothing. about it? Nothing. Uh, he can put a sound wall. You can maybe reduce the speed for them to come in sooner. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not an I'm not a diesel mechanic expert. In fact, no, one of them back there might know more about it than me. Yeah. But if you had to have to you even even if you slow the speed down, as soon as they yeah, let their foot off the gas yeah. to slow down, you're gonna hear yeah. boom. That, and that's it's called engine braking. Well, yeah. they were they shortcut is Jake brake. Yeah, but it's, you're you're using you're using the engine the, itself the to engine. slow itself down. Right, downshifts. Yeah, it's a downshift basically. I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's the best way to describe it. The engine downshifts itself, makes the vehicle slow down instead of picking up more speed. Well, the gentleman asked, is it possible for us to um, not allow trucks on that road? I don't think I can't possible. imagine that. That's not, that, that's not your, in your, it's not in your power. That's VDOT. Something they have to address with VDOT. We that would have to do a study on that, I'm sure, and and I'm not sure. I mean, the other night, I hate to say it this way. You go out and look at my little red car and the passenger mirror on my little red car is banged up a little bit. I'm coming home at 8.30 at night after baseball practice and then doing behind the wheel, driving through Kent's store. Then come around a sharp curve in Kent's store and there's a logging truck at 8.30, two feet on my side of the yellow line. So I went down through the ditch. And unfortunately, the next day was trash day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> one of the trash cans was sitting there. I knocked it over, went back, picked up all the trash, put it back. But I've got to buy a new side view my passenger mirror for my car. That's not a very good example of a driver teaching off. I know. <laughs> it was great. Hey, it was a great off-road recovery. Yes, it was. It wasn't his fault. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go. Well, I mean, that's the first thing I did. I called the sheriff's department. I said, is there really anything I can do? And I mean it's no, I'm not saying that. it wasn't it, your fault that you had yeah, to go off the side of the Right. Road. I mean, it, okay, I could have taken on that front tire and that front <laughs> end of that tractor trailer. <laughs> that Red Ranger would have rocked that rascal. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. and I'm not making light of what you're talking about, but that I don't know if we, Fred, we had no standing to outlaw. Oh, you you don't have the authority to regulate, uh, yeah, regulate the traffic the on the road. It would have to be a VDOT thing. VDOT would yeah. have to somehow yeah. 
stuff into that. It has to be a mandate of some sort. Yeah, but I mean, if you do that, then everybody that's on that road that has a business can no longer. The, you know, the, the prospect of getting something like that out on, the, on those roads, I can't imagine that because you, you, you need to look at the map and see that if you want to get from point A to point B, you haven't got a lot of alternatives. The only way to and get if you outlaw the, something like Route 600, you're you're well, making things impossible for people. Dollar right? General and all those other businesses that and, are on that road. I don't think that no I'm longer. don't think I'm expressing my personal opinion because I hear those vehicles too. Oh yeah, living yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, because you're on that hill right there on six sixteen. Don't build close well, to the road. I hear from six hundred. Oh. Right. I mean, uh, what else? Ms. Get back in the woods. Mr. Chair, may I just make an <clears throat> announcement uh, um, to support our sheriff? Our sheriff is going to be making a presentation on May 12th on, on a Zoom at 7 o'clock for the NAACP. Okay. Oh, it is? Who in the world will be that? <laughs> what, hey, what, I'm sorry. Hey, it's wake hey, up, y'all, and have your coffee at 10 o'clock. It's on a Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday. 10 o'clock. be a lot of retired folks there. It's going to be a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. All righty. Uh, I've got two things real quickly here. Uh, I did have. Uh, a resident that lives straight, straight across from Tractor Supply in the Lakeside, actually in your district. Um, wonder, you know, if there was anything that he could do because the lights from the Tractor Supply. I think I know who, who, the, who yeah, the resident and, may and, be. And I, I don't think our ordinance changes that, but just bringing it, up to no, it. It does. Well, our, our, uh, our ordinance has lighting criteria. Mm -hmm. And that that should have been addressed in this. In well, no, and, and, and Mr. Miles, do you want to come up here? And, I, I, I was going to say they probably have them plant shrubbery and things to knock it down. Just hadn't grown yet. That's part of it. But Mr. yes, Miles, uh, yes, um, Chairman Sheridan, the we're aware of the individual. It's actually, two <laughs> individuals um, who complained to us about it. Um, and at the uh, Tractor supply uh, certificate of um, occupancy compliance. We did an inspection. It's site lighting, landscaping, all of that, um, and it's well within the requirements. The other thing that they really have an issue with is the sign. The sign is internally illuminated. So if, if the sign were um, externally illuminated, illuminated and it's going into the South Boston right of way, it would be a violation. But that's that's not a violation. Um, the closest lighting issue was the area, if you're looking at the store, the outside storage area adjacent to the Sycamore Square townhouses was actually a brighter amount of light but still was meeting the requirements as, it, as opposed to going into the dark area of South Boston Road. And really in the next two to three years or so, as more businesses come into that area, the, the light dispersion or the light it actually will be less because it'll be additional light um, that will be in that area. It's just very dark out there once mm -hmm. you leave sure. um, do, uh, Dollar General and then now Tractor Supply and go down. down so, the road. so they're in compliance. Is they're, what I hear you say. they're in compliance. What we did work out with the store manager, um, the ordinance does require them to turn off the lights at night, other than the wall packs. That, so, like the sheriff's department, if they need to be there at 3 a.m. if someone's trying to steal off, you know, um, supplies outside. That they can see, and that includes the signage, right? Um, yeah, the not? signage would still would still stay on. Um, oh, so it's just the store lights. Just the store doing. parking lot lights right. um, are turned off uh, and dimmed down, um, and then wall packs and other things around the security of the building are still allowed to be on, and they're usually not a problem because they're close into the sure. property. Sure. So, but yeah, we did our due diligence and tried to. Uh, work with the residents. Um, one of the residents actually is displaying um, his television on the outside of his house for being outside with friends so they're not in the COVID um, scenario. So that was one of his complaints that now I can't do that. So, but um, we did our best to, you know, get the light, lighting levels down. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, sir. And then the second thing is, I know we brought this up and I can't think of what the particular taxation or the particular, whether it was whether it was machine and tools, but it, it had to do with 
when we had construction crews, outside crews here that they paid fees, you know, the other counties are doing that where there was enough business. And now that we have more and more construction and more and more business. Oh, it's, it's, it's B poll. No, I, I think it's B poll that that if 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 you were a business it was a B poll tax? I think it's B poll because yeah, it's B-poll. if the county B-poll doesn't have it, it's it paid in the home county. Yes. Oh, and is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. So so if, if if I'm a business and I'm in, let's just say I'm I'm located in Greene County and I come to Fluvanna County and I build whatever I build, I'm right. in construction. Well, if Fluvanna County so doesn't have the B poll, then Green gets the I think Green gets the, the revenue. Let me give you the example yeah. that I that I think will never be topped. And that is when, when they rebuilt the Bremo Bridge, obviously that's a big project. And the great majority of it is in Fluvanna County. Oh, and, well. and the principal contractor was headquartered in Chesterfield. And our I believe it was our our uh, our uh, commission revenue got a call from the from his opposite number in Chesterfield, thanking us for for giving them a big big benefit for the, because of our millions of dollars of activity. What about the, the high school? The high school. What yes. about the high school? That was the same thing. Yep. Right. Yeah, I just I just mm-hmm. cite that as an mm-hmm. anecdote because. It... Alrighty. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Alrighty. Any other? All right. Hearing none, I will now now I will open the second round of public comment. Anyone wish to address the board, please. State your name and address. Keep your comments to five minutes on topic and direct to the board. Is there any, anyone wishing to speak at this time? Boy, I was struggling right there. Ms. Harris, do you have anybody? Is there anybody raising their hand on the computer? Okay. Um, I've got I've got two I need to talk to talk to you about and then get the board's opinion on it. About written comments that we received after the meeting started um one was one that that mr uh, o'brien alluded to earlier that after the meeting started again the comments and, and the board has the comments in front of them but the individual emailed kelly saying that she wanted her comments read publicly okay. but the letter didn't state that so that's why we didn't read it publicly sure. and secondly there was another individual that emailed during the meeting that wanted their public, their comments read publicly too. Again, you know, we can certainly do that. Just like the schools do, there's a cutoff point that if someone wants to submit written comments, which is fine, but sometimes trying to pull them up on the fly can be a little bit challenging. I don't, does anyone have a problem? But but we have two, we have two sets of comments here. Yeah, Mr. Weaver. Whatever. Go ahead. Let me get my water here real quick. Yeah, set your timer because some of us, if one of them's really long. I've got two, two, two pagers. You want one of us to read the second one? It's up to the board if they want to. I'll, I'll probably I'll, 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 I'll go through them. Uh, let's see here. Dear supervisors, um, and name and address, please. Name and address. Uh, Sharon Harris, and she does not, she, she does not leave her address in she's the on line. hardwood road if i recall correctly yeah. okay that's all right let's okay. go ahead she's two pages long yep dear supervisors i'm a resident of Fluvanna county and i'm writing to you in response to the discussion at the april 21 2021 board meeting of resolution 19-2020 i support the well reason request to amend the resolution while i was gratified that you adopted the resolution last summer with a vote of five to zero, oh, i am now discur- dis- disconcerted that you decided not to recognize the verdict in this case. I also want to express my complete dismay at what transpired at the meeting. Specifically, comments were made that ignored the commitment to constructive, honest, and substantive dialogue as promised in the resolution. Furthermore, as outlined in the Board of Supervisors Code of Ethics, members are expected to maintain a respectful attitude toward colleagues and others. Respect was not evident during this meeting. Insensitivity and disrespect were shown to Ms. Booker as well as members of our community who have experienced racial injustice and those of all races and backgrounds who work for equity and justice. Admonishing Ms. Booker and others to just sit, sit back and relax fails to show any concern for those facing racial injustice, hatred, and discrimination. Declaring 
you can't but I can reflects the privilege to be able to ignore racial injustice with the knowledge that your race protects you and your loved one from, from such suffering. Thus, it appeared that some members of the board are woefully unaware of the impact of racism, oppression, and, oppression and white privilege. Without this understanding and awareness, the board is ill-equipped to honor its resolution to understand the inequities and adopt policies to, el to eliminate them and do the work of the people. So I call to you now to do the work, to educate yourselves on the issues and to become aware of how completely insensitive and inappropriate it is to suggest a fitting response to racial injustice is to just sit down and relax. Education and training on these issues are readily available and wholly necessary to restore public confidence in the ability of the board to serve the public good. In addition to, in addition to the disrespect shown to Supervisor Booker, the offering of an opinion by the county attorney on the findings of a court in a state in which he is not licensed to practice law was improper. Mr. Payne cited specific concerns over how the case was presented without formal knowledge of Minnesota law. Moreover, a board member cited this improperly offered guidance as a reason not to support the request. None of this is proper or acceptable. Mr. Payne also made disrespectful and inappropriate comments about the governor of Virginia. His partisan comments were unprofessional and counterproductive to the work of the board. Such behavior does not exemplify the legal profession ideals of public service. Our community deserves better from its leaders and those who advise them. Thus, I ask each of you to recommit yourselves to following the Board of Supervisors Code of Ethics, to engage in respectful behavior towards each other and the community, to listen and refrain from interrupting, to consider all opinions and points of view, including those that differ from yours, and to honor the promises made in Resolution 19-2020. Likewise, to ensure necessary transparency, the audio and video of the meetings must be improved, and speakers need to identify themselves to help the public follow board proceedings. I also call on the board to seek and promote understanding, to find ways to engage with and bring members of the community together, and to make those to get to know and understand those members who support you, as well as those ideologies, though whose ideologies differ from yours. It is only by committing to know and respect each other that we will cherish our common humanity and begin to live in peace and harmony. Respectfully, Sharon C. Harris. And then the other one here, I'm gonna pull up on my phone and this one's a little bit of a struggle here. Okay, so this comment, uh, public comment is from Jennifer Richardson, 12 Hardwood Road, Palmyra, Virginia. Um, let's see here. I watched the most recent Board of Supervisors meeting on Wednesday, April 21st, and I must say that I was appalled at Supervisor Weaver's behavior towards Supervisor Booker towards the end of the meeting when Hayden Parrish's question was revisited. His outburst was completely unprofessional and not the way I would expect an elected official to behave towards anyone, particularly toward the only woman of color on the board while discussing a sensitive racial topic. I would like to remind you that the text from resolution 19-2020 that you voted in favor of last summer, whereas this board adamantly rejects words, actions, and policies that foster division and bring up bigotry, hatred, and discrimination, and condemns racism and oppression of people of color in our county. And be it further resolved that this board commits itself to efforts to engage the community in constructive, honest, and substantive dialogue to better understand where inequities exist and to adopt policies to eliminate them. This board is committed to ensuring a safe and healthy environment where everyone can thrive. And we urge all, urge all county residents to join us in this crucial ongoing effort we recommit to you our intent to build and support a unified community of all Fluvanna residents based upon mutual respect, equity, well being. Supervisor Weaver violated this resolution when he accused Supervisor Booker of fanning the flames as if Black Lives were a fire that needed to be put out. This is a perfect example of white privilege he possesses because, yes, while Supervisor Booker cannot relax because every time her children get in a car to go somewhere, she must pray that they don't get pulled over and killed because of the color of their skin. But Supervisor Weaver can relax because his white children don't have that particular obstacle facing them. 
speaking over and yelling at Supervisor Booker was disrespectful, divisive, and wrong, not only to Miss Booker, but to all of his black constituents in Cunningham. Supervisor Weaver's words and actions fostered division and brought out bigotry, hatred, and discrimination. He did not engage in constructive, honest, and substantive dialogue to better understand where inequities exist. Instead, Supervisor Weaver lashed out, a, out at a black woman. I would love to see this behavior corrected in future meetings. A good start would be a public apology to Supervisor Booker. Even if you disagree on an issue, there needs to be a modicum of decorum displayed. Yelling at and talking over other board members is not acceptable. I would also like resolution 19-2020 amended to include a commitment from the board to invest in professional training on race in America so that they can adhere to the actions in the resolution above. I would like to see the board as a whole reconsider guidelines for res respect, uh, respectable behavior at public meetings because Supervisor Weaver's behavior was completely unacceptable. There were other troubling aspects of the meeting. The county attorney's advice to the board was not based on his actual knowledge of Minnesota law. He was clearly giving his opinion as an ind individual, not as an attorney, because a good attorney would have done some research on Minnesota law before opinioning to the board in a public meeting. Mr. Payne stated he was unfamiliar with Minnesota law, there therefore was not in a position to give advice on the subject of Mr. Chauvin's conviction of second degree murder. As to Mr. Payne's statement about elected officials' statements affecting future outcomes of the case, it is not very likely that a future courtroom will be swayed by a change of wording in a resolution passed by the Fluvanna Board of Supervisors. I would also very much appreciate better audio and visual for the meetings for those of us watching remotely. The board is in a small corner of the screen and it's very hard to see who is talking at any particular time. Please identify yourselves when speaking and do not turn your microphones off. The public deserves total transparency. Sincerely, Jennifer Hudson. Je I'm sorry, Jennifer Richardson. And that's it. Thank you. If there are no others, I will now close the second round of public comment. Do you believe that we can finish our closed session in 10 minutes? If not, I would vote. Uh, do I have a motion to extend until nine? So made. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Uh, motion's made by Mr. Weaver, seconded by Ms. Booker. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5 0 to extend the meeting. Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Chair, I'd like to add section 2.2 37 11 8 3. I took a call from somebody um, that we've been talking to in the past. And just want to bring that up. So, well, it won't take but a few minutes. What, what was this issue? Uh, it, it has to do with uh, Mr. Zaylor. I'm sorry, Mr. Zaylor. Oh, okay. okay. Is it? Uh, well, no. It, I, I'm not concerned about the about who's involved. The question is, what's the subject matter? Real estate. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move the Fulana County Board of Supervisors and a closed meeting pursuant to provisions of section 2.2-371183, real estate, section 2.2-371A6, investment of funds, section 2.2-371A8, legal matters. Well, the Code of Virginia 1950 has amended for the purposes of discussing investment of funds, uh, real estate, and legal matters. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair Bowtie, we're now in closed session. Thank y'all. Chair, um, you want to take a picture of this?
it years. wasn't our – now, he might have thrown some at the end. I don't know who all pitched, but I'm pretty sure they were starting the 10th grader. Okay, I think I'm – This is not right conversation conversation. No, ma'am. This is called baseball conversation. You. This is I like know. anywhere. This is – you know, ready from your stand? This is – we're ready. All righty, Mr. O'Brien. Chair, I move the closed meeting be adjourned in the Savannah County Board of Supervisors convene again at open session. Be a result the Board of Supervisors does hereby certify to the best of each member's knowledge one only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Section 2.2-3711A of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended and two only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened, were heard and discussed, discussed or considered in the meeting. Second. Got a motion made by Mr. O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Weaver. Ms. Eager? Aye. I would get you see you take a bite, I'm sorry. Ms. Booker? Aye. Mr. O'Brien? Aye. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. We're now at a closed session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Got a motion by Mr. Weaver, seconded by Ms. 